All right. Good morning, everyone. And uh, yes, thank you. I'm recording. You reminded me earlier too. Um, so we'll be recording today so that uh, you can go always go find the videos. I'm usually about a month behind in getting them up on YouTube. But the uh, best thing to do is if you do go to YouTube, uh, go to my when you're in there, you can subscribe. And actually, before. Actually, I've got it in here. So um, we're going to go over safari and mail. I mean, they're two boring subjects, but they're the things we use the most. And I'm going to hopefully make them not boring, and you should have a couple aha moments. And <laughs> that would be uh, that would be really really good. Um, See here, come on in. We got a couple seats over on this side. If you're interested, okay. So yeah, and we're gonna hopefully turn you into a search ninja also. So um, just a little background. Um, 1972 or 73. Uh, I didn't have to attend summer school in high school. I chose to, and uh, that was a computer program our computer programming class, and it was at Cordova High School, and it was weird because you had this little machine like this, and you made this paper tape. You've all seen punch cards, you know, the hanging chads, right? Well, this was, it looked like a ticker tape, but it was just punched holes. And what my ambition that summer was to, I had two different snow skis, two racing skis that I was trying to determine which one I wanted. And uh, I, developed a program with the parameters. The skis had been tested and it, one does this and one does this and they had all the different things. So I said, well, what criteria matters to me? And I went in and I said, okay, uh, how fast does it go? Ah, not a big deal. How does it do in high speed turns? And I would, I would just, I would quantify each of those results and the computer did the calculation to tell me which ski I should choose. <laughs> And of course, since I was the one that programmed it, yes, it, of course, it came out to the ski that I thought that I, that I wanted and I, in fact, got. Uh, it was really strange because I got that ski the, that, that winter and then uh, I proceeded to have troubles with the skis. I used to break skis a lot when I skied. I was a pretty dynamic skier. But uh, so I ended up getting the other ski also because they had a... Uh, a replacement plan where you could just, if you broke the ski, you could take it right in. You could take it right into any shop. It was K2, K2, and they called it uh, Spare Pair was the name. Uh, the Spare Pair plan where I could go into any shop and pay a nominal amount, and they would give me a new ski. And I went through seven pair of skis that year. So, <laughs> and then next year they came out with they changed a model and they came out with one and. I couldn't break it, and it was fine. But it didn't. It didn't ski as well. So were they K two? That was the K twos, but the other one was a Dynamic. Uh, I loved the Dynamic skis, which was a spelt dynamic, was French ski. So uh, anyway, so this kind of this wasn't like it, but this guy, this it was this thing, the size of a large refrigerator, in the room, and it had a toggle switch, and each toggle switch had a light, and each of those was an on or an off. It was very binary. And you would do the tape, you would feed the tape into this big computer, and it would do that stuff. So um, this brings up a little bit of a, a history thing. Actually, I'm going to go down to Mountain View on the 6th. Uh, Tesla's having their shareholder meeting down there, and they actually have it in the Computer History Museum. And if you're ever in Mountain View and you have time to kill, if you're a Tesla owner, if you have time to kill because you're charging, and they have, a, they have a wonderful supercharger there. But uh, the Computer History Museum... You go in the door, you start out, and there's an abacus and a slide rule. Big ones. And it takes you from there all the way through all the stuff. And actually, luckily enough, last summer, a friend of mine, and a guy that I ski with and is in the Mac group at Sun City Lincoln Hills, he, this wasn't a museum for him. This is, this is what he did. He started with a Fairchild semiconductor. But when semiconductors, back when memory, believe it or not, a memory chip, 
was wires going across a little magnet and then back in there. And it was just, it was called core memory. And it was pretty amazing. But if you ever are in Mountain View and you have, you can see the museum in two, three hours. But it's just, it's fantastic. So, but luckily when I was there, not this last time, but they had this thing, and, and I encourage you to look this up on Google. Um, it call, it's called a Babbage, B-A-B-B-A-G-E, differential machine. In the 1800s, this gentleman, Babbage, from England, I believe, did a drawing and said this can, and there, were, there was no such thing as computers at that point, but he said this thing would be, I, I think they called it a differential calculator, but it essentially is the first computer, and it was mechanical. So what's really bizarre is, actually, let me get my. So he did it from drawings, or he made these drawings, but he never made the machine. And then, consequently, in, in years since then, they have built two of these machines from his drawings, and they work. And uh, one of the guys was one of an early, early employee at uh, Microsoft, and he spent a million dollars building one. And it was there at the, it was at the Computer History Museum. It's no longer there, but we're able to watch it. And the guy would come out, and you would set certain, you'd set certain of these. Uh, these little flip things, and then over here, you would turn the crank. And this whole thing, it looks like a total Rube, Rube Goldberg machine, but everything spins and everything else, and it, and it calculated how many spins you had to do, and then once you're done spinning, it essentially spits out the result. So his drawings, I mean, this guy just dreamed this up, and they made it, and it works. But uh, they don't have it there any longer, but I encourage you to go. They do have a video of it working. Um, uh, in on Google, it's called a Babbage differential calculator. Where, what was the down in Mountain View. In Mountain View. Let me Google. It, it just Google Computer History Museum, yeah. and yeah, 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 and it'll come up. It's it's very popular, and it's 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 nominal to to go inside. And I mean, they have everything up to the Google self-driving car is on display there, the Lexus that has all the stuff on it. And you can get pictures in the car with yourself. Go ahead. What year was that? Google it. Eight, I think, I, I want to say it was 1889, but that just sinks. Yeah. All right. So actually, on June 1st, Apple introduced the Disk two floppy drive. I just saw this come up on my news feed and I thought it was pretty good to show. So, so that was kind of a big deal in Apple in their history. What other big thing happened, happened in Apple in June? What's the biggest thing ever to happen to Apple? iPhone. Went on sale June 29th. I was in line. I was actually, and, and, I, and I've gotten the new phone ever since. But yeah, I mean, that's a seminal day in Apple. So it was introduced January 9th of 2007 at the old Macworld Expo. And then they announced it. Apple, Apple pre, only pre-announces products if they don't make that product yet. They pre-announced the iPad. They pre-announced other things. But once they had the phone, then they don't pre-announce the subsequent ones. Because then you get into, it's called an Osborne effect. Does anybody know what the Osborne effect is? No. So the reason Apple's so secretive, and most companies are, is because there used to be a computer called the Osborne. And back in the early, early days, this was what, the 70s? Uh, no, probably early 80s anyway. They had this, this thing called the Osborne computer. Adam Osborne is the guy. You know, back then, everybody, every computer was named by the owner. We had Dell. We had Osborne, you know, et cetera. Um, I don't know if there was a guy named IBM. but uh, um, And Apple wasn't named after anybody. But anyway, um, they were going to come out with this brand new Osborne computer. And they had pre-announced it. And... 
The problem was it was six, eight months down the road. And they needed, and, and they pre-announced it, and sales of their existing Osbournes kind of fell off the map. So therefore, they couldn't afford to produce the other Osborne. So it never came to fruition. So that's the Osborne effect, and that's what all the secrecy. And the Spaceship Campus, I mean, Al posts a lot of good things on our Facebook feed, uh, the, the videos when they come up from there. Uh, that campus is going to be open. It's called Apple Park. It's going to be open very, very soon. Um, and they're starting to move stuff over there already. But they're bringing people over in, in departments, kind of. So it's pretty amazing. And that was Steve Jobs. You know, the iPhone was a big deal, but that was his biggest project. And the last time, the last public appearance he made was at the Cupertino City Hall or City Council talking about the project. And it had already been approved, but he was giving them updates and stuff. So pretty amazing. It's a huge, huge piece of land. So uh, you don't necessarily have to grab your iPhones now because I'm going to, every my presentation that I'm going to give you on Safari today, the mail one won't be, but the Safari one will be available on my website. Actually, it's already available on my website. So uh, there's a lot of links I'm going to show you here, but don't sweat it because you'll be able to get them. You'll be able to download the keynote presentation or there's a PDF of it and all the links in the PDFs are there. What's the website? Can't. It's, it's, it's dead. Yeah. So, and you wouldn't want to download it here anyway. Because then you'd know what's coming and that'd be like the Osborne effect. <laughs> No, but yeah, it, I don't know why the internet's out for everybody today. So I'm I'm gonna I'm going off my iPhone. Thank you, T-Mobile. So KenSpencer.com. I've redone the site. It's not perfect. I got a lot of stuff to do on it. But if you were to click on the classes, it was that's that's taken with my iPhone. Believe it or not, that picture that was Yosemite February 23rd or 4th, and it was what's called the Natural Firefall. I had my big camera set up, and the problem is my big lens was zooming into the waterfall. And I got a great shot of the waterfall, but I would have missed what was happening with the clouds on the rest of it. So it was, it was a very lucky shot. I've gone, this was the third year out of four that I went to that, and I don't have to go again because now I've got <coughs> the right picture. So now I want to go capture Yosemite with good snow on the ground. This morning I had Yosemite with snow on Half Dome and everything else and did some great pictures, which I love. It's my favorite spot on earth. All right, getting into Safari. The, the, the morning or the, the early session will be all about Safari. We'll go up to the break. I may have to carry a little bit over, and then the afternoon will be about mail and some mail tips and tricks, M-A-I-L tips and tricks. Okay, don't confuse that. Really. <laughs> Just because it's got blue on the screen doesn't mean that. Anyway. All right, so first off, it's irrespective of Safari. These are some, some search tips and tricks. And, uh, you know, a lot of people call me or email me, Ken, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I look like a hero because I can use Google pretty well. So it looks like I just had that all back in my head, but most of the time I don't. I'm able to Google it and see. So actually, this isn't a bad idea to have on your phone. So if you do want to take your phone out, these pictures of these slides aren't, aren't clickable. So they would be good to have on your phone so you can have them. So if you grab your phone out, I'll, there'll be time in each slide to take a photo of each slide. So actually, i got to put the search ninja guy. There's, he's a ninja now, right? Thank you, pages. All right. So if we go here, so the exact phrase. And to give the example, and this I've, I've, I've plagiarized this from a site because it does it very, very well. But if I searched for Joe blogs, it might bring up anybody named Joe that has a blog. And it, and it might bring up Joe Samuelson. It might do anything. But if I put quotations around a word or a couple words or a sentence, it means search for and only search for exactly what's between those quotation marks. So if I misspelled Joe Bloggs' name and I only put one G in it, it wouldn't find Joe Bloggs because it's saying 
this. It will kind of give you some other ideas, hopefully, with Google, but for the most part, it will only do that. You could say, uh, let's say you want to search for information about your 2011 MacBook Pro. If you put MacBook Pro in there, you're going to get tons of results. If I put 2011, I'm going to get news articles from 2011. If I put in 2011 MacBook Pro, I'm only going to get it exactly like that. And that may filter it down too much, but in fact, that's a way to filter it down. So, and this happens even, I noticed when I go to other websites that have search ones, this is a, what's called a Boolean search. And the Boolean search commands are, you put, uh, Fry's is a perfect example. When I go to Fry, if I look at Fry's and I want to say, uh, three terabyte SSD, if I'm, I'm sorry, let's say I'm searching for a one terabyte SSD, a solid state drive. If I put in one TB and I put in SSD as separate words, it searches for both of those. So if I'm looking for a one terabyte SSD on Fry's site, if I put quotation marks around it, it'll pretty much do it, but the problem is they've got some other weird search deals. But I, I would go, and I'll show this later, how I would go search Fry's even easier. So anyway, that's how you do an exact phrase. It's really, really good. This uses a name, but other than a name, it works out very well. Is that syntax uh, just for a Google search engine or another search engine? Do you use another search engine? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't. <laughs> it's a good point. So Yahoo uses Bing, and Bing sucks. So much so that when I've gone in and I've had uh, to look up things like if I say Adobe Flash or something, they're, they're monetizing it. They're putting stuff up at the top that is totally irrelevant to what you want. It, it's a great point. There's another one called DuckDuckGo, and it's okay. But you know what? Google is, it's, they're not mining this information, but they see it. Okay, I'll give you an example. So, and I highly recommend Google as your search. Um, if we put in Chevy Volt, for instance, it would be bad if a bunch of Ford dealers show up underneath that and you say, you know, Ford Mustang 2017, or you get ads on the side. So, of course, the Ford dealer would love to have his results show up when you say Chevy Volt. But Google is constantly tweaking and changing their algorithm so that you get results that you want. Because that's the only way that search is relevant to you. And what the deal is, is that people try to game the Google system, but they're constantly changing it and they keep very secretive about it. Because if, if it wasn't pertinent results, you would stop using it. Just like you'll stop using <coughs> Bing because it's not pertinent. And it's Microsoft. And, uh, you know, it, it, DuckDuckGo is okay because it doesn't do ads and doesn't do tracking, but, you know, Google is just the best. Plus, the other nice thing is if you're signed in to your Gmail account, your Gmail address, it lets you go back and see your search history. How many times have you gone back two days later and go, gosh, I saw the perfect necklace, and now you can't remember what it is, and you can go back through your search history and find that. You can turn off your hit search history. You can do private browsing if you want. But you know what? Why not let it be more useful for you? So Google, I highly recommend on all of your devices. I'll show you later how to make sure that it's on. But I, Al, I think that this, since it's a Boolean search and a search is just really a computer code, I believe that it would probably work on most browsers. So, so the next one is exclude terms. Let's say he was a, uh, let's say Joe Blog, and I don't know if it is, but let's say Joe Blog was, uh, let's say this said Calvin Klein, okay? And you didn't want it to include anything about Calvin Klein with the word genes in it, J-E-A-N-S. So you would just put, you already know about the front part, but, and you don't have to use the quotation marks, but this just says, there's a space and then minus genes. So go ahead and find, I want to know about a, I want to know about uh, Chevy Volt 
minus 2015. I don't want to know anything about the 2015. Yeah, obviously I would want to find it with 2017, but this way it's the opposite way. You can restrict that and you can put numbers of things out there. And what that is, is if you get too many results and you need to filter your results, that's where that becomes very beneficial. Don't worry about the quotation marks in the, in the beginning. The minus can happen at any time. I could say uh, Apple, let's say, okay, here's a good example. Uh, Apple minus MacBook Pro. So I will get an, all my results won't have MacBook Pro in it. Okay? So the next one is either or. And here we're doing a name is Alex Hearn or Hernandez. So this is saying, oh, search both ways. Because let's say, you know, Hernandez can be spelled different ways. So maybe it's a way of you're going to search for everything Alice, Alex Hearn or Hernandez. And so what's happening is, is even if this was misspelled, it would go ahead and, and show it in the results. Now, some of this stuff, Google does a pretty good dry, a good, good um, results results driven formula for you, and it will try find that kind of stuff. It will try to auto complete things for you, but you can have the either or. So uh, this would be good as let's say somebody had an interesting first name, but you knew their you had their maiden name and you had their married name. You could put those for that. This one is, it doesn't get used a lot, but it's very powerful when you need it. This one is interesting. So you'll notice the little tilde, and that says, I want to find plumbing, but I want it to be something similar to university. So it will use the word university and look for that because they're, in this case, looking for university plumbing. So it will, and Google again tries to get you like words, but it tries to get you specifically university first. But remember, you have university, un universities, and things like that. That comes into play when you have something like that. You won't use this one a lot. This one I use all the time. I always recommend iMore.com. iMore is fantastic for uh, Mac and Apple based stuff, they have wonderful articles. So many times when I'm putting things together, in fact, when I was putting the Safari thing together, I said, okay, I did. I don't put in site, but, you, but it's better if you do. I just put in imore.com Safari tips. And I was able to look through what their Safari tips were and stuff. And I used a few of those. Uh, this is not one that I plagiarized from them. I think I plagiarized this from Macworld UK because it had the best chart of doing this. I didn't have to make up this chart. Go ahead. I-M-O-R. Yeah, I-M-O-R-E. Like more, but it's I-more. I-more.com. All right. So, but like, let's say, like in this case, they're saying, <coughs> okay, I only want to search The Guardian, which is a UK uh, news site, and I just want to search that for selfie stick. So it's going to give you the results from that site. So believe it or not, um, like Hewlett Packard, a lot of times I'm having to go out and get information for people from Hewlett Packard's website about drivers. Will the, this printer work with the Mac, et cetera? And them and Fry's. Fry's is another good example. Their website searches are horrendous. They're terrible. So if I want to find a particular thing at Fry's or at HP, I put in hp.com Mac uh, 10.7 drivers. And it will go within... Uh, HP's website and find it because it's crawled in there and found it. Fry's is a good example. If I'm looking for that one terabyte solid state hard drive, I'll go in and use Google, do fries.com, one terabyte SSD, and it'll usually come up with a result. So it's very, very, very useful. And it's so much better than the search they have on their own sites. Now, this is probably the most powerful search tool you have. So the asterisk is essentially a wild card. So they give a really good example here. Where there's a, I don't know what, there's a way. So this is the great Scrabble killer, okay? So you can find your Scrabble stuff pretty well. So think about it. When you're looking at a Scrabble hint, it says, uh, Ricky Bobby was in this movie. And you can put the asterisk after it. 
whatever it was, Talladega Nights or something. So um, you, you can put, but the other thing for an asterisk is, let's say, let's say I'm looking for, I'm trying to think of a name that would be hard. Well, okay, here's an example. Let's say someone didn't know how to spell Nixon for Richard Nixon. If you put Richard N-I-X, because you know that part, asterisk, it's going to say anything after the X is a wild card. Give me everything that comes up after it. So, uh, you know, the O-N would work. It would have others. It could be E-N, um, like, like Titleist, Titleist golf balls. You don't know what it is, T-I-T-L, and then put the asterisk. You don't know how it is. So an asterisk is the joker. It's the wild card. And this is very, very helpful. If you stop typing, if this was at the end of a sentence, if you stop typing, Google will try to fill in the rest for you, and they'll try to fill in for you on the fly with that. Did that work for some words? Did you only work a couple of three? Yeah, yeah. And actually, believe it or not, there's an app for that, too. You can sing the, the lyrics you know to a song and do it. But yeah, this would work for lyrics. So, and I mean, this is, a, this is just a cliche, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. So where there's an asterisk, there's a way. Searching between two values, and this is just the easiest, per, most perfect example is, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I want, it, I want information about a MacBook Pro from 2012 to 2014. So I just say, this is prime minister. Give me the prime minister between 1920, and then it's two periods in a space, 1950. So it will give a list of the British prime ministers between that period. Same thing with presidents, et cetera, obviously. So it's a good range. Um, dates come to mind, but I would, uh, any, think of other, any other uh, examples you could use? You got, got a victim you need to see? Dick Bellwater. Dick? No? Oh. Kimberly downstairs. Okay. He asked if Kimberly downstairs? Yeah. Yeah. And so Bob Gwine's the only one down here, and then they're otherwise, yeah, they're, otherwise they're, in, they're in McMurdo. Okay. So this is an interesting one, and I didn't know about this, but if you're, let's say there's, like for instance, I, I go to all the Mac blogs and read a bunch of those, and I read a bunch of the Tesla blogs and stuff. But I may not know about other ones that are out there. So if I say related colon and then that website, it will give me ones that because of people's searches and their response to the searches, it says these are similar. The Guardian's a news site, so it gives you New York Times, Financial Times, Independent, which is another UK, Telegraph UK, obviously because it was UK biased, but it was there. So uh, you can use that if you're used to if there's a place you go that you like what they have and the information they have, do related. And I got to tell you, this is about, so the way Google keeps from people from gaming the system, when you do a regular search, you get those list of things that look pretty close to what you want. Well, Google further realizes that if you search for the word um, <coughs> Chevy Volt, so you search for Chevy Volt, and everybody that searches for Chevy Volts if there's five things listed and the majority of people click on the third thing, that makes its search ranking rise to the top. So in other words, somebody could try game the system, and if they game the system, then there are a, a non-appropriate result, so people aren't going to click on that, because you know you get a little bit of a preview of what the result is. So Google further uses that to figure out what they want to do and put things to the top for you. I mean, when you think about the dynamic of what's going on there, it's amazing. But just think about how relevant Google searches usually are for you. And that's what is really amazing. And Google makes their money off the ads. The top three lines, they're, they're clearly, you can see their ads. And then the stuff on the side. That's how they make their money. And you know what? Hey, I'll go with it. It's great. All right, so in your system or in your preferences in your browser in Safari, 
you go into Safari preferences and click on search, and there's where you make sure it's Google. Okay? Well, your phone's different. When I hook my phone up later, uh, I'll show you on the phone. But on the phone, by default, it should be. Siri searches Bing, unfortunately, because Apple struck a deal with the devil on that. I do want to point out this website. This is a fantastic website from Apple. I'm going to click on four slides here in a second that show you some of the features of Safari. And uh, you know we're going to go through quite a bit of those. But it is a good site for it. So, And, and obviously, iMore has a guide. So apple.com slash Safari. All right. First thing is iCloud Keychain. How many here have more than one Apple device? That's why this is the 12-step program for Apple products. <laughs> I can't tell you how many I have. I can't count that high. Um, and I do that for you guys. I get the new Apple products for you guys. Actually, at this point, we should I forgot. Uh, Monday, 10 a.m., go to apple.com, and you'll watch the keynote from the WWDC which is the, uh, the keynote uh, Worldwide Developer Conference. When is the keynote for WWDC? Allow me to direct you to Apple's rather fabulous oh. website. When is the keynote for the WWDC? Apple.com should be able to answer that question. <laughs> Two days ago, it gave me the exact one. It says, yeah, 10 o'clock. So anyway, uh, so... The WDC, WWDC rarely is hardware introduced. Um, it's the Worldwide Developer Conference, which are the developers that make all these wonderful apps for all our iOS devices and our wonderful applications for our Macs. And Apple has thousands, I think it's well over 1,000, uh, Apple engineers there to answer those developers' questions. So they're able to go hands-on. They're taking over the whole San Jose Convention Center. So uh, they can't do it at the new Apple Park. This is too big an event for that. It's the 5th through the 9th, and they'll have a keynote. But while they usually don't unveil hardware, the indications are, the rumors are, and we know how that is, um, we'll see an internal update to the MacBook Pro. We may see the revealing of an iPad that has a less of a bezel on the screen. Uh, and we will see the preview of, because in the fall is when we're going to see the new, uh, where we're going to get the new iPhones, we're going to get the new iOS operating system, iOS 11, we'll get the new Mac OS 10.13, 10.13, TV OS 10, and watch OS 4. <laughs> um, but and whatever other devices Apple comes up with but th this will be the preview of that so Apple will, will tell us and show us some new features on these new operating systems because they have to expose the developers to it because the developers have between then and the fall when it's re released to tweak their programs and make programs work with those operating systems so it's very essential that they come there but uh, I think we're also going to see some hardware, and that's unusual because Worldwide Developer Conference, but it's just because Apple's kind of been behind on some stuff, and part of that is is the chips for the MacBook Pros, uh, Intel was a little bit behind, and they're getting the chips from Intel. So uh, uh, actually, the, the next general meeting we have, I will be doing a wrap-up of what happened at WWDC and some of the prognostication that goes on uh, going forward from that. So... Anyway, uh, so, no, no, I don't, I mean, it's very hard to get an invite and I'm not a developer. Um, I can go home after it started and get every session they did is available online for free. I have a free developer account that I use for that, but no, there's no sense in going. It's just nuts and bolts. So, and I couldn't get, I mean, it's, they have a lottery and it sells out in like two hours. So. Anyway, so iCloud, getting back to this, iCloud Keychain. We all have multiple devices. And is there anyone here that doesn't have a problem with their passwords? 
Mm, same here. Uh, so, what the and this is why I encourage you to use Safari over Chrome, over Firefox, over Opera, because it integrates with everything. It's a fast browser, but the big thing is, if I go to Amazon.com and enter my password, and I have my iCloud keychain on in my iCloud settings, then that password populates all my other Apple devices. And believe it or not, if you have iCloud keychain on, and one of your devices is signed into, like let's say your iPhone has the password for this internet, and you have iCloud keychain on, it will automatically put that password in on your other devices. So just to, you know, um, but, and that's for Wi-Fi. If you go in and let's say you have to change your Amazon password, it will change it everywhere. It'll say, do you want to update this password? And you say update all, and all your devices will have the new password. Okay? Really, really, really important you have it on, but this is another reason to use Safari going forward. I just said it's the definitely yes, definitely. Of Why not? I mean, give me. And I mean, what's your trepidation? I guess is the question. Good question. Okay. So, uh, if I go to a, let, we'll use Amazon as an example. So I log into Amazon. It says, "Do you want to save this password?" And I mean, this is a perfect question. Do you want to save this password in your keychain? If you say, another one. I don't have a computer down there. I mean, if you add a new password, does it automatically have a new keychain? It's none of the internet's working. I oh. believe that it's Mac Nexus. Oh. It's either Mac Nexus or the password. It's Mac Nexus, Mac Nexus 1984, or the church password. Or I mean, the church phone number. But yeah, see, ours are off too. I think their whole internet's off. I was able to get into the routers and look, and it's. Oh, it's too hard. Yeah, the router seems to be working, so. Uh, I have you unplugged it and plugged it back in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it should be. I can. Uh, you know what? Let me get it out of. I'm going to go get the password out of my keychain for them. So I just go up. This is a perfect example. So I go up to the magnifying glass and type in keychain. Hang on, Jim. I'll. Uh, so I'll go into keychain access. All right, keychain access. It's built into your Mac. Please, if you go in here, never, ever, ever change anything. Make it a read only. So the one down there is called Grace Cafe. So there's Grace Cafe Airport Network Password, what I think is the same as the other. My most recent one is. So if I go to Grace Cafe, hit Show Password, and it says, oh, Ken. We want to get your password out of there. What's your login password for your computer? So it's very safe because it's very secure. We'll talk about this when Jim's not here waiting patiently for it. But it looks like it's the church phone number, Jim. So try that. So the same number that we're using to... Yeah, I, I try to make it be the password and the thing. They By default, it's not as secure, but no, it's we don't idea. care. All right, we'll try it. Thanks. Yeah, try that. If not... It uh, looks like I got into this one using Mac Nexus, so it's a possibility I, it was configured with Mac. Just the word Mac Nexus, lowercase. Okay, thanks. Uh-huh. All right, so we're in Keychain. Perfect example, perfect example. Do I want to remember it in the Keychain? Yes. And the reason I want to remember it in the Keychain is it goes to all my devices, but we're with Apple. It's very safe, very secure. In fact... The way you have to look at your keychain is, uh, this church is a perfect example. There's, actually, there's separate rooms, and let's say every room has a unique key. Let's look at it. Let's use an apartment complex as a little better way to look at it. So you have an apartment complex with all these units, and they all have their own unique key. For a minute, we'll forget there's such a thing as a master key, okay? Forget that exists. But if the plumber shows up for 3B, and needs to do some work in it, they go down to the office and ask for the key for 3B. So the person in front says, oh, I have to go get the manager. 
So you go back in the manager's office, and on the wall in the manager's office is a box that has all the keys in it. And that box itself has a key, and the manager's the only one with that key. So those keys are pretty safe and secure. They call this keychain access because passwords are keys. So what I did is it stores all my passwords. You saw them come up, and it said, oh, I want to know what this password is. Show me this password. And it says, you've got to go get the manager. So I'm the manager. I know my login, and I can go in and get it. But if somebody else was in front of your computer and they didn't know your login to your computer, they would not have any access to those. And in fact, if someone were to try to, try to uh, leverage their way in surreptitiously other ways, they're all encrypted. It's very safe, very secure. And it's the same on your iOS devices, very safe, very secure. You can't get into Keychain as easy on your iOS devices, but you can use uh, assist, uh, settings, Safari, and you can go find them in there. But the best thing is, is if, if you've forgotten your password, you can go in here and find it. Okay, and remember, let it fill in for you. If it has a wrong one, fill it in with the one that's correct, and then it'll say, do you want to update the password? And you say update or update all, which means all your devices that are connected. We had a question here, then you. How did your loved ones do that? They weren't allowed. How did they do the password? I don't think they the wrong So, yeah, so, well, if it's filling it in, and it's not right, you need to fix it. If it's filling it in and you click log in, then it's okay. But what happens in mail sometimes, today would be a perfect example because we can get Wi-Fi to that router, but that router's not seeing the internet. So your mail might come up and say, I, I can't check your mail. Uh, uh, we need to put your password in. Well, no, it's not that it can't see my password. It's not being rejected. It's just not connecting to the server. So be careful when that happens. If I'm in mail and I see that happen, I immediately go to Safari and see if I'm on the internet. And if I'm on the internet, then I go back and I may restart mail or restart the computer or restart my iOS device to have it try fill it in correctly. Because many times it's trying to ping the mail server and if it can't see the server, it says, well, it's not letting me in, it must be a password problem. And it pops up, don't immediately go do it. But that's the other thing that happens is, let's say I go to Amazon.com, and it's, it's getting smarter with Safari. If you change the password right away and it says, now do you want to update it? But what I always recommend at every site, <coughs> excuse me, if you go to a site and you go into that site to change your password, and you successfully change your password, log immediately out, and log right back in because you know the password you just created. This may be the last time you know it, but log in immediately and then say update password. Okay? Yeah, so what I did is I go up to the magnifying glass and I click on that and start typing K E Y C. It's in your uh, utilities folder, but I just, this to me is an easier way to get there. So then when I see that, I just hit return and it fires up Keychain. <coughs> Excuse me, it's supposed to. Uh huh. And it's this little icon with the keys here. I don't recommend, you should now. Everyone, raise your right hand. I promise not to change anything in Keynote. <laughs> I'm trying to save you from yourself because if you keychain, I'm sorry, thank you. I said, you know, she said, I do keychain. If you go in and when that shows up, you do have the ability to change your password, but that's not where you change your password. People think that if I if I want to change my Amazon password, I just go into keychain and change my Amazon password. Well, no, because then it just says, well, Amazon says that's not a password. So you go in and change it first, let it remember to change it, and then it changes it everywhere. Don't ever change your username or anything in Keychain. Please, please. I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom here, but you have to use it judiciously and make sure that you do not make any changes in there. Treat it as read-only. Well, Google Chrome has it. But, yeah, and I wouldn't trust it. 
What about the Levi from the teaching? Why? I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> These, this is a piece of data, and it takes up so little room. Back in the early days of Keychain, you would have Amazon 12 different times if you change your password 12 times, and I would always look for the newest. Now it stays updated pretty well, so don't, don't worry about it. You'll find, and so what I do is if I do have multiple iterations of a certain one, I click on the sort here, and I go date modified, and that'll bring the most recent up to the top. And that way, well, first of all, in the upper right-hand corner here, here's how I can filter it down. Let's, uh, well, here, let's do Fireside. So I'm filtering it down, and now I'm only seeing Fireside. I'm, I've filtered my results down, and I can go over here, and let's uh, say, well, sort. And then, boom, it's there. Okay, and I don't know why I have multiple iterations. Oh, also, you'll notice over here, don't ever click on the system one. If you do, it's going to make you put in your username and your password for your computer. If you go to login or iCloud, you'll just need to put in your user password, your, your login password on your computer, which is the one that most people don't remember, but you should have that. Okay, go uh, here, here, and then here. Is one password a substitute for keychain? Could be. It's pretty good. But why, why add another level of complexity? All right, since we're on passwords, I'm going to do a, a thing here, a little, a little sideline on that. Go ahead, question. If, if you go to settings and go to Safari and click password. What, where are you? Are you in, you're on your iPhone? Uh, iPhone, iPhone. Yeah, go to settings, Safari, and then there's password there. And then hold up the Safari. Right. That's the same. It syncs with this keychain. There's no real keychain. There's, you know, there's keychains for Wi-Fi, but the only visible keychain on your iOS device is that settings in there. Oh, so and this is the same password as the password in there. Never, never. Read only. You raised your hand. You swore to me that you wouldn't. <laughs> Judy. You never change anything in Keychain. So, how does Keychain? So, when you do passwords in general, most sites don't let you change it. Sometimes 90 days, but they won't let you go back to an original password unless a year has passed. Yes. So, password formulas are a good topic here. It's just going to take me about three minutes to do this. Let's put it where everybody can read it. So. Beach ball and text edit. Come on, it's not good. There we go. So, does anyone here use the same password password everywhere? Come on, don't lie. <laughs> used to. Is there any problem with using the same password everywhere? What's the problem? They get into one, they get into everything. I agree, but I'm a bit of an aloof, so I say use the same password everywhere with this simple exception. So let's say your password you use everywhere is MacNexus1. Don't use MacNexus1. But preferably, it should be a word that's not a, not a proper word in the dictionary. Certain street names, certain people's names, whatever. Don't make it too easily guessable. But let's think about this a second. You have a password for Amazon, let's say. So I want to use MacNexus1 there. But I'm at the Amazon site, capital A, lowercase m, the first two letters of whatever website you're at. Because you always know the website you're at. So why shouldn't my Amazon password be capital A, lowercase m, Mac Nexus one or Fluffy one, whatever you use. Now, I want to I want to point out here. It's important that you use a capital letter in the beginning. And you once you start this protocol, you have to stay with the protocol because 
You'll never forget a password and you'll never have to write it down if you use this. Capital A, then the second letter of Amazon is M. Mac Nexus 1, all in lowercase. And the number is at the end because if we think about, we have so many iOS devices now, and these are the ones we blow the passwords on the worst. So if I go in here and I do a capital letter in the beginning on my keyboard, what happens after you type the first letter when it's capital? The keyboard re 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 uh, reverts to lowercase. So then we've got lowercase across. And then what do I have to do to get into numbers? I have to flip the keyboard, right? So then I got the number at the end. If you put numbers in the middle and capitals in the middle, you're going glug, 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 and you're just like doing this. And it's moderately more secure, but it's a lot harder to end it. So let me give you a couple more examples and I'll answer your question. So if I'm at Wells Fargo, what would it be? Somebody said F. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> Amazon's not a two word, it's W-E. You have to stick with the protocol. I made that mistake in the beginning. And then I'm at, you know, Pizza Hut, for instance. And, well, was it P-I or was it P-H? Okay, so if I'm at Pizza Hut, capital P, lowercase i. Okay, uh-oh, what do I do if I'm at American Express? Exactly. Who cares if it's a couple that are like that? Now, oops, thank you. That was a typo. See, I would have, do you want to save this new password? All right, so um, the fact that they're similar doesn't really make a difference because the chance they're, if they get anything, the one, the one thing you want, other than your, your bank sites and stuff, your credit card sites, you want to keep your email very secure. You can add another level of complexity to this, which probably quadruples the security of this password is, to pick a special character and only one special character and always use that special character. It could be an exclamation mark, a dollar sign, or an ampersand. I don't recommend the asterisk because if we go to the keyboard on here, you have to go two levels deep to get to the asterisk. Okay. Back there first. Yes. Uh, that was the question I was going to ask. But also, when I have done my password in the past, I will put in a special word. Special character. Special character. And it won't like the one I put in. Exactly. Oh. So if you use those three, you're probably okay. okay. But and, and so that's why it's and then and if you're consistent, and you can always put two of them. But I mean, I just put them at the end. And then here's the weird thing is so. I had, it's really bizarre, but I had a really simple Apple password for a long time and then I changed it, but then they said I had to recreate my password and I ended mine with one number. So forget the asterisk and all that. And don't use a period because if you use a period when you write it in your password book, you're not going to know whether you were meant a period or not. And when you write it in your password book, underline the capital letter. Because many of us write with a capital first letter anyway. <laughs> So underline it so you know it's a capital letter. But um, so what I had to do in Apple is I just put a second. I end mine with nine and I put another nine at the end. So that consistently is, hey, if my first one doesn't work for a year's time and you have to redo it, I just add another digit at the end. But Apple's protocol is probably the, the, the best. And what it says is it must be eight characters or more. Don't go really long. Save yourself that. <coughs> Eight characters or more, at least one capital letter, and obviously one lowercase letter, at least one digit, and no character can repeat more than twice in succession, which means I couldn't do 999 because that's too many. Now, I could have a 9 in the front and two 9s at the back. That's okay. It's just in succession. They don't want somebody to go that, 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 like that because that's insecure. <coughs> okay, question, Charles. Oh, I'm sorry. He was first. Here. I had a situation where one of my financial institutions did not accept dollar signs. Then, then choose a different one. And yeah. sorry. And then going forward, use that different. Yeah. I, I, I found the asterisk works. Per, I mean, sorry, the exclamation point works pretty well. 
Charles and then back there. Do it. You have to do it from the site and then tell the keychain to remember it. And uh, if you've already used this protocol, you may have to put an additional character at the end. But uh, the thing is also, do not, do not go out and change all your passwords. Okay? And the worst thing is people re re they take their password sheet and they recopy it over onto a new sheet because the sheet's getting really old. Yeah. Yeah, like that's a typo, okay? You're going to miss do one of those, so don't throw away the old sheet. And we know that sheet gets tattered and worn and you've got four different variations of the password. Every time you change the password or add it to the sheet, put the date on it. Okay? This is the, I mean, I make most of my money off people's passwords, okay? That's the biggest thing we have, and I don't like making my money that way. So just write them down, date them. Kimberly? Is there a, a place to search for non-readers? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like, 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 Go to the non-dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but... Yeah, but, so again, and... and this phrase you're going to use, this little short phrase, it does take some work to do that. But the way to do it would be if you think of a word, try to do the Google on the word and see if it does it differently. But, you know, it can be, Pete suggests one where he uses the lyrics of uh, the first letter of, of words in his favorite song. Yeah. But please don't make that little phrase any longer than seven characters. Because we're adding two at the front and one at the back. You're going to have ten anyway. Just, it, it needs to be easy and rememberable. But it could be a street name that has unique spelling. It could be a, a pet's name. I a lot of I didn't I don't use it now, but I used Smedley was my dog, and you know that's just not out. That's not in the dictionary. So, but the dictionary hack is less appropriate on this because you're putting letters in front and a number at the back. What they do is the hackers can have it run through a dictionary. You know, like John Podesta's password was password. I mean. <laughs> It didn't take the Russians to have to hack that. I mean, that's pretty easy to hack, okay? And, and the other thing is they do social engineering. So you would, you would be reluctant to use your last name. You would be reluctant to use your current street name, reluctant to use a maiden name or a parent's name because if people can gather that information on you, they'll look for derivations of it. And that's a little bit overboard. And this is not the most secure password in the world but it's much more secure than what most of you are using. Okay? Over here, then here. Go ahead. Uh, if uh, I change the, pa uh, the password of the keychain, is that the devastating or do, do I have to do anything? No, when you go into the site, just to add, it'll say, do you want to remember the new password and tell it to remember it, it'll overwrite it. So if, if I change the thing to remember that, it will override it. It may leave the old one there, but then the, it goes for the most current. So, all right, uh, let's see here. Okay, so was there another question on keychain that I missed over here? Go ahead. Well, I was going to mention if you just change your password, go to the site, it'll click on the email link for somebody. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I'm going to cover that when we go into mail. That's important. So, the other thing about using Safari and having everything sync on your cloud with Safari is, the bookmarks I have on one device propagate over to the other device. So if I'm, you know, if I'm going along and I want this pat, this thing later, I can do that. The other one is tab view. I'm going to talk about tab browsing in a second here when we go into the live view of Safari. Uh, that's repeated over on your other devices too. Like many times I'll be on my big iMac and I was looking at something on my iPad. And I go in, and I can have it show me the tabs that are open on my iPad, even if my iPad is closed, and what was there. And I can go, okay, yeah, that was that article I was reading. Now I can read it on my big screen. And the last one is reading list, which we're going to go over here in a second when I go live into Safari. So live demo. And I've got moderate internet. All right. Yes. Um, if the uh, iPad, iPhone, laptop are not synchronizing, what is wrong? You don't. Ha you're either not on the same iCloud, or iCloud isn't on, 
and, or it's not correct, or 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 it's um, the iCloud keychain isn't on. So those are things that all need to get resolved. So if we go to kenspencer.com and you click on classes, I'm going to sh just show you this so you have it here. This is some the videos I do for the Lincoln Hills Apple User Group. My video archive of all my ones like I'm recording today at Ken, under classes. And then today's Safari and Search keynote is there as a keynote and it's as a PDF. And then this is a travel presentation I did here last time, but I, I have my travel presentation there. Because a lot of these have some different links in them. So anyway. Yeah. It's right out front. It changes the color, changes all the time. It's weird. All right. So if I'm at, <coughs> if I'm here at the home on kenspencer.com, there's a new thing I want to show you in Safari that allows you to pin the site over here. So this just is a tab. I'm going to show you tabs in a second. But if I slide this over to the left, it becomes a little icon right there. There's kenspencer.com. Let's take MacNexus and slide it over. And it's a permanent little pin there. So my Facebook is there. My kenspencer.com, my MacNexus are all right there. Like if I click on that, there's the MacNexus Facebook page. Al posted this this morning. The new thing in wireless is mesh wireless routing. Really, really, really important and really good. So, in Safari, I want to, oh, I got to go to, this is the wrong, hang on here. Okay. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to create a new tab in Safari. Tab or like file folder. Oh, first, you notice at the top, a lot of you may be missing your old favorites bar. When you upgrade to Sierra, and even when you upgraded to El Capitan, Apple decided in their imminent wisdom that they, you don't need that favorites bar. So you go up to the word view and come down to it. It'll say, so you won't have that favorites bar up there. You want it back. So you say show favorites bar. That's really important. All right, now you have the favorite bars. Those were all those websites you kept and held for a long time. But I'm going to go to, for instance, CNN.com. Oops, I didn't click up there. So CNN.com. So this will give me, I don't necessarily like the site, but it's a great example to give things, and hopefully the Internet will catch up here pretty quick. Uh, so the home page on these news sites are usually just a table of contents of what they're offering. So if we go down here, we'll try some, something not controversial. There, we'll go to what to expect on Apple's big event Monday. So I'm going to hold my finger down on the command key. And if I click on that, you'll notice... It didn't open in a new tab. That's weird. That's the first time. Come on. That's really weird. Ah, they've changed their website. Okay, so let's do this. So I open a new tab by hitting Command T and I'm typing in CNN.com. All right, so I'm going to put that to the left. While that's loading, this is the, here's the story about it, right? But there's all this garbage on the right-hand side. I don't need all that garbage over there. And you see it's slowing everything down and all that. So... If you'll notice right up here at the top, there's three lines. I'm sorry, three, three full length lines and one shorter abbreviated line. If I click on that, watch what happens. 
The garbage eliminator. Yes. So that's called reader. Now, you'll notice those lines don't appear on the main CNN, or this is a Google page. They don't appear on the main CNN page because remember, this is a table of contents. It would be very hard to summarize this, right? So there's no reader there, and you wouldn't want a reader there. So if I go back over to this one, let's look at the difference. Here's no reader. See all that garbage? And yeah, you can get the video. That's one thing. This just happened to have a video attached to it. And then if I click on reader, it's like this. But you'll look, any of these links are all fully clickable, and I can click to other websites. Now, every website won't have reader available. Some trick it, and you get really mad if they don't. But when you have reader, it's great. And you also have it on your iOS device, which I'll plug in and show later. Top left corner, same spot. Same spot, same lines on your iOS device. And then the other thing is, is if you were to print this, so if we go to, we're in Safari, and if we go to print, that's going to save a lot of ink, is printing it from this. So there's the example of, and by the way, this is how your print window probably looks in Safari. Make sure you hit show details. Once you've clicked it once, it will always be there. But look how clean it is. That's three pages. Let's go turn reader off and see what it looks like. Oh, one of one. Uh, it hadn't finished loading probably. Reload it. Maybe it's not printable. It's not fit to print. Search and expand. Don't do me wrong here. One of four pages. There, look at how ugly that print will look. There's all your garbage. You're wasting a lot of color ink and you just want to read the article. Okay, go ahead. Um, are you talking about printing it or emailing it to someone? When you say it doesn't have the source. Okay. Watch. So if I go to the share. Oh, my, my screen's zoomed in. Sorry. Well, if the byline were there, it would be there. You don't have to use it. Nobody's forcing you to use it. So if I go email this page, watch what happens when I'm in reader. Because we're going to go over mail in uh, the second half. It's taking a while because my mail wasn't fired up and the internet's being slow. The internet through my iPad. Come on. There it is. So... I don't see any problem with that. Look how clean it is. And what's that right at the top? They would what? Have to click on the link that you said wasn't there? No, all the information's there. And that's the link to the, to the actual website. If I click on that, I get that. So when you go to email it, it's got both. And I have it in Reader. I could send just the link or a web page or PDF, et cetera. But if you go from Reader and try to email it to someone, it's all clean. And they can, still, they can click on any of the links in here. And they can click on this link. And they go to the original web page. No. If you email it is. So you could email, you could print, you could print this. But why would you print it if you have a clickable link? You save it as a PDF and it's fully clickable. So what you do from here, when you've got mail like this, you just hit Command P. Oh, what did it do? Come on. 
So you would pull that up and print that or save it as a PDF and all the clicks are linkable. I don't know why you would want to print something and not have, I mean, you can't print it. It's not, it's not clickable. If they don't have a computer, what good's the link? Right. So you're all right. Well, this is a this is a getting out in the weeds and not necessary because there's plenty of ways around it. Yes, but if you print from this email, it'll have the link up right on it. Okay. If you don't like it. Use the whole page, waste the paper, do whatever you want. <laughs> buy more, buy more stock in HP. <laughs> okay, let's let's leave this. Let's leave this and let's move on. Okay, so that's Reader. Most people find it very useful. Uh, it's also on your iOS device, and it's, I mean, just for reading it especially when you're on a small device. Now, the other beauty of this is you'll notice there's a little A up here and it's small. You can zoom the text in and out on Reader and change the text all you want. That's also on your iOS device. So that's very, very helpful when you're doing this article. And if you do print it, it will reflect what you have it zoomed into. Some people like the sepia look like that. It's a little easier on your eyes, etc. So this one's not as bad. So, what's your question? If you want to save it, to save it as your bookmark or a favorite, what would you do? Yeah, I'll get into that in a second. Okay, so we beat Reader to death. Go ahead, Cheryl. Help me beat it to yeah, death more. To the right on the keyboard. What's that? That little microphone or speaker. That's the speaker. So, would it read the article? No, no, that's another thing. But the problem here is that was that ad that started playing. So what's, what you play in, in Safari, you'll notice, let me scroll out. So you'll notice right here there's a speaker, and right here there's a speaker. I, had, I have those on mute. But if you click that, it will mute it. If you click that, it mutes it. You go to these websites now that have all this autoplay crap, and that's how you can defeat that. So you can defeat it by the page or on your browser completely without having to put mute on your computer. Okay, that's what that is. So that's a speaker. All right. So let me look. Shares tabs. So the tabs across the top are wonderful. Quit me laughing. Um, think of them like file folder tabs across the top, and you have different ones. I can make as many as I want. And trust me, you want to make a lot. OK, uh, one more before the break. <coughs> favorites bar and tabs, OK. So the other thing is the favorites bar. Now, I find it very useful to have uh, folders on my favorites bar. For instance, if I click on finance, well, there's only two different sites. I don't have that one very well populated. Photos. Web. So there, when I was looking at my solar system for my house, I don't know how my Lincoln Hills mug got in there, but I made a folder called solar. <laughs> CNN coming up again. I'm closing that. I'm closing that tab. Hang on. Mail says no. Cancel. 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 Jeez. I got to restart after the break. Yes, I have failures sometimes too. So I go up to force quit. Force quit mail. Just sucking the life out of my battery. Okay, so uh, if we go up to the solar one, for instance, I'm going to show you how to make this bookmark folder in a second, but I can go to each of these sites by clicking on it. 
But what's really cool, if you had like four different news sites that you normally go to and you make a folder, watch what happens. Open in tab. It starts opening every one of those. So let's do this. Let's show you how to make a folder. I'm going to close these tabs. Command W, Command W. All right. So if we go up to bookmarks and we say edit bookmarks, we get this little screen, okay? You can see your favorites are the top one and you can see the folders within folders and things like that. But I want to add a new folder. Actually, if I go into favorites, sometimes this works. And I say here and it says add bookmark folder. Okay, so I'm going to add a bookmark folder, and it pulls it up. It's at the bottom, and I'm going to call it test. And now, it's down there at the bottom, but what I want to do is I want to get it on my favorites bar. So I'm going to drag it up. i got to wait for it to get going. And I'm going to go right into my favorites and put it right between TV and there. So now you'll see test came up up here. So we've made the folder and we've put it in our favorites bar. And remember, your favorites bar is expensive real estate. You have to keep the names really short because you want to have a lot of them there to do different things. But when I do a folder, I can go here and I can say, let's go to apple.com. We'll go there. And then once it finally loads, so I click up here in the address bar, click on it. And then there's a little thing here called a favicon. That's what that is. And I click and drag that. See, I'm trying to drag it and everything's trying to move out of its way. Oh, but if I hover over that folder and I let go, it says, oh, well, what do we want to call that? Well, we'll name it Apple. It's fine. Let's put in KenSpencer.com. So now I click up in the menu bar. I click the favicon there, and I drag it over test. There we go. And let's do MacNexus. And then we click up here. There is no favicon. I'll have to fix that. There it is. Now, when I go click on this folder, all those ones I just put in it are there. But again, the cool thing is, and I can add I can add sites to that all I want. I can have that just be huge. But if I want to open them all at the same time, if it's like let's say it's your early morning and you want to read the news sites or the financial sites, you say open in tabs and look at that. It opens them all at once. And especially when we, like we're here where we have a slow internet connection, they can be loading in the background and I'll be able to get to it a little quicker that way. There, Apple's almost loaded. This wasn't loading in the background. And then, all right, so we're going to take a break. Come back in 10 minutes at 10.30, please. We'll finish Safari and then venture into mail. Stop the recording. Oh, thank you. You got my message. You were exactly two. I know. I looked at the crap. I didn't know if I Because I sent, it, I sent it a day early, and I didn't get a chance to do it, and then I looked in, and it's like, damn. Oh, well. Yeah, well. I'm saving money every day. Did you happen to see that one password was hacked? Folders. Ah, add to home screen. So if you go to a website, on especially on your iOS device that you visit a lot, actually I'll see if this works on because we're using having to. Oh, what internet am I on? We're not on. No. Let's do it on my phone, and I'll connect my iPad to my phone. 
we believe it or not, we're just having to do all this because the internet's not working anywhere here. So we'll see if I can do reflector through my hotspot connection. This would be good. Ah, sweet. Yes. Okay. So my Safari bookmarks have synced with everything else. You'll notice I have the favorites bar. In fact, you'll notice test shows up on the top up there. This is my iPad now. So what we did earlier on my Mac <coughs> has propagated to the iPad. And if I tap on that, oh, I think I eliminated the Mac Nexus, but anyway, there are two there, et cetera. Now, let's say I'm going to go to an article. Let's uh, go to imore.com. imore.com. Learn more, be more. I like that. Uh, my favorite saying on any website was this one that used to be called Deal Mac. And it was a bunch of Mac deals and everything. It said, it said how to go broke by saving money. <laughs> so what's in Serenity Caldwell's WWDC? Your bag. So I'm clicking on that. And again, we're running this and this through my phone, and then it's connecting to this through my phone. All right. So we go down here and we look at all this. This is what's in her gear bag. Serenity's my kind of girl. She's got her skates there because she does roller derby, but you don't see a lot of makeup in here. It's all Apple stuff, right? <laughs> But we go through here, and she, uh, so we go here, and now the little share arrow up here, the share box. So I'm going to tap the share box, and I'm going to say, I could add it to my bookmarks, right? I could say, add to my favorites. I could say, add to reading list. Ah, let's add it to the reading list. And I'm going to, when we go back to the Mac, you'll see that that is in a special category, kind of a temporary holding pattern, where we'll be able to see that on our Mac. And I want to do one other thing on my device here. I've got to take this Apple site, and I'm going to delete it. I'm having to make room on my home screen, because that's the only way you'll see this. So when I go up to that same share box, actually, many times you'll go to a website where it's reduced for your mobile. It senses this as mobile you can do request desktop site. So if sometimes it doesn't give you what you want, you want it to look more like it does on the desktop, which will be good. On the, on the iPad, it's great for that. But on the iPhone, you maybe want the mobile one. But if I go back over here, it says add to home screen. So let's say this is a website I go to a lot. Uh, Mac Nexus, for instance. Bless you. So if I say add to home screen, and it says there's what it's called. I'll just call this test. T-E-S-T, -E and I'm going to say add. And now, look at that. It now looks like an app on my iOS device, and that's simply a bookmark. But it's quick, easy access, because if Safari's not running, I just tap that, and it's going to take me right to that page. Actually, it was that page. I would have done iMore itself right off the bat. But that's how you can do it. The same thing on your Mac is you take that little favicon we talked about, drag it over to your desktop, and it won't show up cool like this, but it'll say a web clip, and you just tap on that, and that's a bookmark right to it. Go ahead. Off the desktop? So I'll, I'll delete this one. So I just press and hold, and then they get really nervous. They say, oh, my God, I'm nervous. What's going to happen here? Uh, uh, are you, oh, are you going to delete me? Oh, oh, yes, I am. Oh, do you really want to delete me? Sure. Yeah, I'll delete it. <laughs> so that's how you delete apps also. And that's how you move them around. You know, you, you press and hold and they get all nervous and then you can move them. You can move them to third screens. It's kind of tough for me to manage because like on my iPhone, I have over 1,300 apps. <laughs> so, but I can use Siri to launch any of those. So that's not a problem. So we're back in Safari here, and uh, we also have the print box. So, oh, by the way, so remember we have the reader lines, 
right here? The reader lines are right there, and if I tap that, we've got it clean. And of course, if you print from your iOS device, you have that. And remember, you have the ability to change the font settings too. And that really helps in here sometimes. So um, if you're just sitting somewhere, especially on the iPhone, if you need the fonts to be bigger, you hit the little A, and then that comes up, and I can say, oh, make it bigger, 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 bigger. You're not changing any of the other stuff. So, okay. Ken? Yes? I've been trying to delete things. I keep pressing on them, but I can't get them. Well, you might have an S or newer, so you're pressing too hard. Just press and release. We can look at that afterwards if you'd like, since that's not really Safari or Mail. Um, so back out to that. And obviously, this side isn't too bad. There's a little bit of junk on the side, but you've seen what we saw before. So uh, again, not every site has it. Go ahead. So if you're going to email, or if you want to email this, let's try this. I don't know if it'll work, but I'm going to click here, and I'm going to put the little handles on it and highlight this text, okay? So I can copy that and paste it, but let's see if what happens when I go to the share thing and hit print. Nope, it's going to do the whole thing. So here's, let's do this. Let's go back into reader mode, hit share, hit email. And now when it does it, now I can go into this text if I want, and it's all editable. I can delete what I don't want. Okay, So you can't get too specific on it. I do want to show you one thing that you can do on the Mac and on the iOS device. Let's look here. Okay. I'm highlighting that. And look at what happens is I have speech enabled. So it'll read you the text. It'll do that if you highlight it in mail and everything. Where you do that on your iOS device is you go into settings, general, accessibility, and speech, and you select speech selection, turn it on. In other words, you select that area and tell it to speak to you. I do this, I have my phone mounted, I can stop, I can highlight it on it, and I can have a play through the Bluetooth in my car for me. So not only can I text and email while I'm driving, I can now read the internet. So, all right. So go to settings, general, accessibility, and then speech. And then it's speech. And his speakers are louder than mine. He's looking around. He's like, who's doing that? That's you. <laughs> That's okay. No, what that is is when you do turn it on, it's giving you a volume and tells you what it is. And the other thing is the speak screen you can do. This is good if you're very sight enabled or sight uh, uh, impaired. You hit speak screen and it'll do the whole screen. And then the other little thing is you notice his was kind of slow, hers was real fast. You can be a tortoise or a hare for it to speak your selections for you. <laughs> and and you'll really... Speech selection reads selected content. <laughs> so when we had the guy from the, California, or the Sacramento Society of the Blind, he has his speech going like wicked fast because he's not, he's not encumbered by seeing things. He can listen to everything. So. All right, so then what we want to do here is we'll go back to Safari on our Mac. And we'll go to imore.com. Oh, actually, wait a minute. I was reading Serenity's article. What did I do with it? I put it on my reading list. So if I go up here to this little thing right up here that looks like a book, if I click, oh, I click on it open, 
And look at these little glasses. That's my reading list. So if I click on that, oh, oh, it says error. Oh, it probably wasn't fully loaded when I did it. Maybe someone wasn't fully loaded. So we'll see if it loads. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, well, actually, what I can do is, watch this. So up in the upper right-hand side here, you see this little interlocking boxes? Well, now it's loading for us. But if I go here, this shows my tabs that are open. But look at here. Oh, my mi iPad mini. These are the tabs that were open. And I have a few tabs open. <laughs> you can have unlimited tabs open, and I do. That's how many tabs I have open on my iPad. So it should be my most recent one. Oh, there it is. So this is on my iPad, even if my iPad was shut off. And I click that, and the article will come up now. And that's from it's from the reading list. It just didn't save it quite correctly. And I think it's because of the internet problem we're having. But if I come down here and I say I highlight this. Why isn't it highlighting? There we go. So when I highlight it, I control click on it and I say speech. I've been in Northern California for six WWDC since 2011. That's One in town experience and five cross country packing journeys. So you can speak it to you, and that can do it when you're doing a document and email, things like that. Let me look at any other, what other Safari things I don't want to miss. Oh, search on page. This is huge. All right, so here's an article, and let's say we want to find the word uh, we'll look for the word Mac here. Or no, we'll look for the word iPhone. So if I go up to, and it doesn't do it here, but it does on your iOS device. But if I go to find under edit, you can see it says command F. Now, if you notice in the upper right, we get this little window. And I'm going to look up the word iPhone. Uh, I'm going to try spell the word, type the word iPhone correctly. <laughs> iPhone, no, no. Jeez, you'd think after 10 years I could spell iPhone. <laughs> All right, so now it shows me that the word iPhone on this page is there eight times. And there's some little arrows, see? So now, and look at what it does. This is the current one it's on. And when I click the arrow to the next iteration, there it is. Then the next iteration, the next iteration. Now, this is really helpful if you're in the news a lot and you want to search for your own name. <laughs> but how many times do you have a long article and you're looking for something in particular? This will do it. And if it isn't there, it'll say no results and it won't do it. So you just simply go pop, 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 pop. And then it goes around and starts at the top again. And you can see it actually takes it out of the header like that. So it's very, very useful if you're looking for specific things. I want to show you another thing on your uh, in Safari. Let's go to the word. Oh, let's just do headphones. So if I double click on the word headphones and control click or right click on it, I say look up. And it pops right into my dictionary definition of that word. So sometimes you're reading an article and there's a word you're not too up on, perspicacious or something like that. You could highlight it and it'll tell you and then you can add that to your vocabulary. Uh, and then if we say open in dictionary, it opens the dictionary app and you get thesaurus and everything else you want there. That actually applies on your iOS device and your Apple device. What if you're not a spell? What? If you don't know how to spell the word. Well, it wouldn't be in the article if you didn't know how to spell it. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you're typing and you don't have to, we showed this once a long time ago, how to find, how to get the spelling. Google will do it for you. But that was the Google thing. It was an Apple trick. Uh, well, that'd be a whole different, yeah, it's dictionary and all that. So uh, I, I'm going to field any quick Safari questions because we've got to move on to mail. Okay. <laughs> so I'm more. 
app? It's just a website. No, I made it look like an app by saving it on my on my iPad, but it's just a website. It's the new version of Macworld, for instance. It's just they're wonderful. They have they have great articles. They are the best Apple information site by far. And we've had them present at our different things. So Randy Caldwell, uh, Renee Ritchie, uh, and I listen to their podcasts. I mean, they're just it's they're doing a fantastic job, and they and they'll have they have full to do guides. If I want to if I want to teach somebody if somebody's brand new to an iPhone, I have them go to imore.com and get their whole iPhone guide. No, I don't need to. So it's looking in the page. It doesn't have to be highlighted. So it's essentially rendering the page, and it's looking for itself. You don't have to highlight. It doesn't. It's the whole page, not what you've highlighted. So this is not a page. No, this is just a website. It's a website. Okay. Yeah, and this little find the, the when I so I'm going to hit done. So the easiest way is to Command F. This pops up, and it's only going to search that page you're on. But here's what's cool is, let's say I'm I've got three different tabs up. If I type this criteria, like I've got iPhone on this one, let's go over here to, uh, well, Apple. They don't have a lot of dialogue on this site. But if I hit Command F, look at that. It still has my most recent search in there. And then it says there's four iterations of the word iPhone. There, there. Command F brings it up. Or if you go to... Uh, Edit, find, and I don't want Google, I go to find, command F. And that's very, very helpful. And again, like here, it goes across the tabs. It won't automatically search, but whatever last search you used, it will go through these different articles. I've done that where I was looking for something in particular, and Google came up with different, different articles, and I've got them all up in tabs, and some of them don't even have the particular word I'm looking for. All right. So, like we said earlier, again, a lot of I, I look like a hero sometimes because I can Google things pretty well. But many times people will they ask they'll email me a question that would be so easy to put that same question in Google. So let's say let's try this. How do oh let me google that for you.com. So somebody may come up and I'll say, hey, you know, if you're having problems with that, go ahead and reboot your phone. So they could easily put into Google, how do I reboot my iPhone? So rather than me spend time sending them back links and everything, I'll say, how to reboot iPhone. Okay? And then I'll say git link. So there I've got the link. So what I email back to them is this little link. And here's what happens on their end. This is on their browser. Oh, how to reboot <laughs> iPhone. Hit Google search. And then now the results come in. <laughs> so that's the exact same results that I would have got if I'd sent it to them. So it's, it's the letters. Let me Google that for you. L, let's go back to the, and I'm glad you, I, I did that when I did this Safari presentation just uh, yesterday and, or day before, and I had that in there. But anyway, let me Google that for you. Hopefully we'll get the screen up here and you'll see. There it is. Let me Google that for you. And it really just goes to the Google site. But it's, and then the problem is some people don't get the joke. And they go, well, I went there and it didn't do what I wanted. You know, so I didn't want You can, as I always like to say, you can't push a rope. I learned yesterday. 
on the phone? Yeah. And that's this. That's there's two ways to do that. No, I did that to a friend about three weeks ago. You know, with a little sarcasm, and I get back this capital letter, four exclamation points. Thank you. She yeah. was so <laughs> delighted. You could totally. This point. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for thanks for googling that for me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and she was happy. Oh, she was beyond happy. She really was. But, you know. Yeah, but the problem is, is you're you're building this entire this this level of dependence that you don't want to be. That's what I always tell people. To you need you probably your tech support for a lot of your friends. Tell them to join Mac Nexus, and then you don't have to be their tech support. <laughs> Plus, you want to get more friends into the, the Apple cabal that we have because you need to have someone to unload your old devices to at an, at an, at an overly inflated price so you can get the new stuff, okay? All right, so Apple Mail. Um, I declared email bankruptcy many years ago. And that's why I have, oh, it doesn't even show all the ones, but I have like, oh, I don't even have my, my one Gmail account on here. Uh, I have like 170,000 emails. <laughs> but Ken, why don't, why don't you delete emails? Because I know as soon as I delete that email, I'll need it tomorrow. <laughs> so I have some clients that have, you know, they go through and they, delete, they make me sick. They delete their emails and store them and do everything else, but they keep a really clean inbox. And no less than five times, I've had them, they say, hey, what, did you send me this information? I said, yeah, I sent it to you and I can look it up. It was on January 12th and all this. They say, well, I can't find it. And I go, well, did you delete it? They go, yeah, but I really need it. Can you send it to me again? And that proves my point because the way Gmail gives you tons of storage, You've got such great search capabilities. I hardly <laughs> ever put thing in fo anything in folders. I do or in, in mailboxes. I do some, but most of the time I just let it go because I have incredible search characteristics. And with Gmail and Apple, you've got plenty of room for your email messages. So don't feel compelled to, especially on your iOS devices, because it really doesn't hold your mail unless you've got an older Pop account. If you've got an IMAP, it just gives you a preview of it. It doesn't really live here, and it doesn't take up much room. Uh, speaking of mail, who here has an email that is their internet service provider, whether it be Yahoo, SBC Global, att.net, Comcast, Wave Cable, any of the others? Raise your hand. Many of you have been to my class before and you still haven't learned. <laughs> SBC Global, Yahoo, att.net is by far the worst email service there is. And the problem is, is that they're not in the email business. They're in the internet, well, I don't want to say internet service business because we're talking about AT&T, so service doesn't go anywhere there. <laughs> but uh, but the, the, the thing is, is let's say, you know, years ago, MacNexus was an internet provider. Before there were common internet providers, we were an ISP. Well, we're no longer an ISP. But let's say, well, years ago, there was one called JPS.net that was very popular in Sacramento. I had that. And luckily, I only for a while used their email address. I was Ken Spencer at JPS.net. And this was decades ago. And uh, they got bought out by One Main. And actually, I, and then One Main got bought out by Earthlink, is who I used before JPS. So it really kind of went full circle. But I'll give you an example. Comcast is a good example. When they first came to Sacramento for internet, I got them because I was struggling through DSL at 26K back in the day where I lived. And it was because old phone lines, it was terrible. So Comcast comes along and offered high-speed internet. But Comcast didn't want to have the email. So they used a company called At Home. So my address would have been kenspencerathome.com. So at home got bought by Excite. So at home went away. Now I could would have been had to have tell everybody I'm now Ken Ken Spencer at Excite.com. Then all of a sudden, Excite goes away, and Comcast says, "Well, I'm going to let AT&T handle my email because it was 
ATTBI at one time, if you, if you were back in the old days of Comcast, ATTBI, the BI for broadband internet. And even though we're the competitor of Comcast, Comcast didn't want to have the email because email has a huge amount of customer support and service met with it. So I was ATTBI. Then Comcast decided they're going to handle the email themselves, so it became Comcast. And I'm sure in the near future it's going to be Xfinity. But if you had been a customer, and if you'd have been a customer of theirs, and using their email address, you would have had to change it five times along the way. And the stupidest thing is, you could have stayed with at home the whole time if they had done their work on the back end. But they wanted to brand it and make sure that everybody saw it. So in that case, it would have been five different changes. This was before Gmail. There was Hotmail was about the only, and Yahoo were the only free services. But I went and registered my own domain. I had Ken at KenSpencer.com. I got it because I didn't want somebody else to get it. Luckily, I got it. But during that whole time, I used that as my email address. But I kept, I had it forwarded to At Home. I had it forwarded to Excite. I had it forwarded to ATDB. I had it forwarded to Comcast. So none of my friends had to change their settings for me. I never had to change my email because I had a non-internet provider email. I can't say it strongly enough. Get rid of it. ATT Yahoo is the worst, and that's what SBC Global and AT&T use. The worst email server. You always get this thing. Can't hit the server. Please reset your password. All this other crap, and it's the one that gets hijacked a lot. It doesn't get hacked a lot, but it gets hijacked a lot. And it's just been bought by Verizon, another company that is so well known with excellent customer service. <laughs> so, Become a free agent. Don't use Comcast for your email. You can continue to have it, but going forward, I recommend Gmail wholeheartedly. And get two or three accounts on it and have it. And you can use it. They have the best spam filter. They make their money by people going to the website and reading their mail where the ads show up. If you use the Apple Mail program, which we're going to talk about today, you don't even see those ads. Google makes nothing off of you. But that's okay. They're making plenty of money. So... Um, it, it, the other thing is, is by being a free agent and a way, like for instance, when I moved to Sun City, Lincoln Hills, I had Comcast for my internet, luck, luck, internet and luckily I never used them for my email, but up there, they don't have Comcast, it's Wave Broadband. She has Wave Broadband in West Sacramento, so if you move from Sacramento to West Sacramento, you would lose your Comcast email address within 30 days of ending your account. Some people keep paying them money when they're away from just keep that email account. Become a free agent because the internet's changing dramatically. In the next three years, you will no longer get your internet over wire. There is a thing called 5G coming out that will come over just over the cellular towers. Gigabit speeds and huge bandwidth. So you want to be a free agent and you go to Gmail and things like that. Plus, Gmail is designed to have multiple devices. So you can check your email one place, and whether you, whether you read, reply, or forward, it syncs with all your devices. Why don't you recommend Apple? That's a good second choice. Uh, there are some issues with it. And you actually have to pay for more space if your email gets too big, talking to the guy that has 170,000 emails. But it's, there's some, I mean, if you want it to be safe, the safest, most secure, most private, by all means, is Apple. The most versatile is Gmail. Part of the reason I use, I use them both. I have Ken Spencer at Mac.com, and I have my shortest one, N-O-S-K-E-N at Gmail.com, that I use. I have three different Gmail addresses I use predominantly. But um, it's because they give you 15 gigabytes of storage, you'll never run out. And I can go back in there and search it. But one thing, so Apple's all private and secure, and that's why we love Apple, and that's important. And believe me, that comes into play. But for versatility, Gmail, because if I do my bookings, if I'm taking a trip somewhere, and I do my booking, if I do my, e I use my Gmail email for that, which I do because that's the one that's, that blocks the spam the best, uh, it'll go, I can use a thing called Google Trips that is a free app, and it'll go through my emails and find my hotel reservations, my flight reservations, and all that, and keep that in this little app right there for me. I didn't have to add it to it. Now, 
that may be a level of insecurity that you're not, you don't want, then keep it in Apple. So an Apple is very safe and very secure. Uh, people get a little bit worried about Google and their security and stuff, but the funny thing is, is Google is pretty respected about it, but remember, they make their money by your demographic. So it's not, it's not as tight as Apple, but they, uh, they at least disclose everything they're doing. You, would, you wouldn't believe it, but your Comcast, your AT&Ts, your Yahoo's do more scraping of information out of your stuff than you can imagine. And they do a heck of a lot more than Google, but they just don't disclose it. Google discloses it, so then it looks like they've got a mark against them. Apple just doesn't do that. Apple makes their money from you other ways, and they don't need to. They don't need to sell your information, or in some people, they think it's selling your soul. But you know, <coughs> but good question. It's just, and they all work. Gmail or iCloud are the ones I recommend. Believe it or not, AOL Mail is pretty darn good, but it was just bought by Verizon too. So, okay, go ahead. My wife has a gazillion emails for her Yahoo account. If I could talk her into going Gmail. Uh, would her emails reside in the Gmail on a cloud? So, and it would free up storage space? Storage space on what? On her iPhone if she then purged her Yahoo account. Well, it may not be taking up room. It's if you have an IMAP or what's called a POP. So an IMAP account, which Yahoo does didn't always offer, but they do on mobile devices. In fact, they were one of the first ones on the iPhone to offer IMAP, which means the... It doesn't really live on the device. It lives on the server. You're just kind of looking at it. When you tap on it, you get it down there. So you can go into your settings on your phone and see if it's taking up room. And only POP accounts, old SureWest accounts, old Comcast accounts, old AT&T, SBC Global accounts will be popped. And you want to change, get those over to IMAP, which you're just better off going. But here's the deal. If you get a Gmail account, tell all your friends and family your new email address. And don't tell all those spammers that you're getting on your old AT&T Yahoo account that you've moved. And then that'll just stay there. And at some point, that email address never goes away. It's always yours. And unless you leave the company, the Yahoo would be a free one. But um, it's, uh, it's always going to be there. But what you can do is just leave the spammers behind. And at some point, that just becomes a nascent account because you're not interested in looking at it or anything because it's got nothing vital in it. But you still can check it and keep it. You can say, forward my Yahoo to my Gmail. But I don't really encourage that. A lot of people, you want to leave that. You, you, you want to just tell it to the people you need to know and then let the other chips fall where they are. And spam's a big deal. All right. Um, Go ahead. When you came from Yahoo to Gmail, do you cancel Yahoo? No, you can't cancel, as I just said. You can't cancel an email. You just stop using it. And then you change your outgoing address and things like that. So let's go. Think. All right. Scam and phishing emails, please. It was said earlier. Never ever click on a link that's there. Go ahead if it says it's this is your bank and your 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 stuff's being here. Hey, a lot of people are getting the one that says your iCloud has been compromised. Click here and do it. They make web pages look just like it. You click on that, it looks like it's the Apple page. It's not. So log in the way you would normally do. If it looks like it's from Wells Fargo, go to wellsfargo.com and log in your normal way. Never, ever, ever for anything click on any link in an email unless it's something about an article you want to read or something like that. The problem is, is it will make it look like a website. So like, let's say you made it look like apple.com. You go in and they say, well, you need to reset your iCloud password here. So enter your, enter your user ID and your iCloud password. And they'll say, well, no, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Well, enter it again. And you've just given them your, I, your if you can remember your Apple ID password, uh, you've just, the best part is you'll probably give them the wrong one because you can't remember what it is. So, but, but they just, they, it's the same thing as those little credit card capture devices they have at the gas pumps where you put in your, your card and it reads your card and then, it, and then they have a little camera that sees your pin. Little tip on that, if you ever use your debit card, put in a fake pin first. It'll say that doesn't work because the camera will record that and then just put in the real one. So, but anyway, that's, yeah, just be careful. Apple Mail, as we talked about, which is very good. You can get a free iCloud account. It integrates with everything. Gmail does the same thing. 
this is talking about Apple Mail as far as the application. It's the postage stamp on our dock or on our iOS device, it's the little envelope. It's simply a program that reads email. On this computer, I only have two of my email addresses linked to it. In my inbox here, I only have two, where on my other one, I have about six different emails on there. I could have a Yahoo, I could have a Gmail, I could have three Gmails, I could have my Apple Mail, things like that. They're in there. This is simply what's called a mail client, M-A-I-L, not the other kind of mail client. Um, and it, it goes out and gets your email. For instance, Safari is a browser client, basically. Chrome, Opera, all of those, Firefox, go out and read the internet. Well, this is just a program that reads your email for you. It goes out to the server and grabs your email. Now, you can make it very useful for you and let's see. So is there anybody here that's not currently using Apple Mail on their iOS device or on their Mac? Not using the mail program? Not on your iOS device? I think I'm Mac, but not on my computer. Are you a Mac? Yeah. Okay. And so you're not using the postage stamp? You just go into... Sometimes I do, but I have... Well, then you're using it. I have a Chrome one as well. It's different. No, Chrome's a browser. You have a Chromebook? Yeah, I mean, well, not a phone, but I had a computer that was Windows as well as a Mac. Well, then you're not going to be able to use Apple Mail on it because it's not an Apple no. computer, but on your on your Apple. What was the other one that wasn't using? Are you using the browser to go to your emails? Yes, I'm using the browser. Okay, but you're going to gmail.com to see your to see your stuff? Um, yes. Okay, so it's real easy to set up, and, and I'll show you in a sec here. You're using the browser? Will you not mail? I'm using Gmail. But do you go to gmail.com and your Safari to get it, or do you use the, the postage stamp or the envelope? I use the little uh, thing on the email. Does it say so Gmail? The little image on my screen. Okay, tell me what that image looks like. Does it look like an envelope? <coughs> no, it, well, I, I shut it off. I, I shut so then you don't use it? But I can go back and use it again. Okay, why did you take it off? Yeah, why did you take it off? Because um, I'm at home most of the time. I read my emails at home. I get tired of getting them all on my phone, so I just thought I don't need it. I can read it at home. If I go away okay. trip, I can. Turn it back on. You can tell it not to bug you. You can tell it not to get them all the time. But and you use browser? Is that what you were? But I, uh, I'm still using the Yahoo.com. But in but in the browser. Because the browser's worse. Never, ever go to yahoo.com to get your email in the browser. Because there's so much, you know, we talked about how Reader cleans up the page. There is so much crap on that page. I've had people with older Macs. The computer becomes inoperable for days. In fact, the only way you can do it is change that home page away from that. So that when it fires up, I had to disconnect it from the internet. Change away from that. There's so much garbage that comes up on the browser. It slows your computer down like crazy. Because... They're trying to serve up all those ads. Google does it clean. Google respects you in that regard. Use the Apple Apple Mail program. You're not going to get any of those ads. But there's one thing I noticed. You know, I usually get 250 or 300 spams a day. I mean, uh, maybe a year ago. Yeah. Well, uh, and the last three or four months, I only get three or four spams a day. Okay. Anybody else getting the rest of his? <laughs> <laughs> they could be filtering it, and that's okay. And maybe they're getting good at it. Gmail, on the other hand, is the best filter out there. Yeah. And if, if I wanted to get an extra Gmail account, would I have Come pay me. <laughs> I'll, uh, pay me, I'll, I'll sell you one. <laughs> if I wanted to put it on to make sure I received it, do I have to do anything to put it up on the left-hand side of the top so that it will still highlight it, or will all Gmail accounts come in on the So what it does is, if you're in mail... You, you, you normally have the inbox, and the inbox is usually closed. And if you click on the inbox, it's the compendium of all the accounts you have. But if, if I hit the disclosure triangle and open it, now I have two different inboxes. And whichever, so if I click on the inbox, it tells you where it is, and it actually shows me which mailbox it went to. On your iOS device, it, will only, it won't show you what inbox it came to. You can hit all inboxes. But if I just click on this one, for instance, this is one I hardly ever use. That one's there, and it shows me, okay, that's the most recent mails there. 
And then if I click on this one, this is my Mac.com, it shows me the most recent there. Okay, but if I hit the inbox, it's the compendium of all of them. So if I have eight accounts, I just keep it on the inbox. But if I want to check one account to see if what's just happening in that mailbox, I'll do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. If you had a Gmail and a Mac and a Yahoo, you'd have to have to go to three different browser windows. And the beauty is, is this way I could reply to it. And by using Apple Mail app, it integrates with everything. You saw earlier how we emailed a web page. <coughs> Excuse me, how we emailed a web page. Well, also, if you want to add photos from an email into photos and things like that, it's all integrated in here. I don't get why you can tell anything. Well, you don't have the Apple Mail program, the postage stamp? Would you go to a browser to go to your email, like Safari? Yeah, Safari. Yeah. yeah, so no, do it this way, and I'll show you how to set that up. So the way we set that up, you can Google it, or if we go in, so with the first time you, ha you fire up mail, you're going to be faced with a screen. I'm going to show you how to get that screen, but this is if you, in fact, already have it set up. You go to Preferences. I could go to Add Account, but I want to go right to Preferences. And I go to General, Accounts, then there's a little plus sign down here. Now, see, I have some accounts on here that I don't have active on this computer because this isn't my everyday computer. I just kind of use this for other stuff. I would just activate them. But if I hit the plus sign down here, this is the screen you're faced with the very first time you fire up mail. And it says, choose a mail account. Okay? So... I don't encourage you to use your Comcast email. You can. You would say add other mail account. If you're using an ATT, SBC Global, you'd use Yahoo. If you wanted to use Google or if you have a work one that's an exchange server, it's there. So if we type in Google. Now, remember, you have to have the account already. This won't create an account. It will, this will just add the account to your mail program. So to go get an account, you go to gmail.com and create an account there. Enter everything. It asks for very little. And then create it. And remember that password and write it down and use the protocol. But then tell Safari to remember that password because you'll want to have it remembered there. It also will remember it in here. But then if I'd already got the account made, I click on Add Account. And then you come in and you say, so you type in whatever account you just made. Uh, and then hit next, and it will ask you for that password. The next screen after this, there will be some buttons. It'll say, do you want to use context? Do you want to use calendar? Do you want to use all that? You don't. You only want to click mail because you're using iCloud for all those other things. So just click mail. And then what it will do is, all of a sudden, you'll have a new mailbox over here. And the first time it checks for mail, it may ask you to verify and put that new pass, that password you have for that account in again. Okay. And after that, no muss, no fuss, no ads, and you're ready to go. Those of you that aren't using this, do it. Those of you that are, you can add that new Gmail account. You're going to rush home this afternoon and, and get to get rid of your other account. Don't get rid of your other account. Just start using less. And then what you do is start emailing your friends and say, hey, I've switched to xyzgmail.com or xyz.icloud.com. Please update your address book. All right. Um, Go ahead. So when you open a new You don't need it. You're not using the contacts. You're using the contacts that are in your address book. Those are syncing with it already, and that's a whole, that's in your contacts already. If you use the Apple Mail program, it doesn't matter what you, so you can set it up, but it's using its own address book that you've already used. You're not having to use the Yahoo address book. So you're supposed to have other than Yahoo. You're overthinking it. It's automatic. I have, a, I have a box here called Previous Recipients. These are everybody that I've communicated with, if they're in my address book or anything, and that's in there. It's part of mail. It looks at 
if if you have a Yahoo account, you sent something to Tom Jones at musicisme.com or something like that, and you now have a Gmail account, and you say send music to Tom Jones at musicisme.com, it's going to go because it's the computer that's storing that address. Not you're not using Yahoo to pull that address out. That's the problem. If you use a browser, everything is specific to that browser. This is a little bit getting in the weeds, and I have program. I, we do a whole class on contacts and and stuff. So we've got a pound through mail. So uh, we're not going to do signatures today, but one thing I want to point out is the big tool you have here is thing called junk. So we have a junk folder, and you can see how it syncs some of these things are, oh, that's actually Scott's Cheap Flights. I don't like that in junk because that's a great one. So it comes in brown, and it goes in your junk folder. Your, your email provider will sometimes filter the spam for you, and it won't even come to you. But other times it'll come through. But what's cool about the Apple Mail program is if you get something and you say, I don't want this in my inbox, I'm going to send it to my, my junk box. Now, you also want to go check your junk box every so often to find make sure that you haven't gotten an email from somebody you know that's in there by mistake. And if you did that, you would click that and you would say not junk. Okay. Now, I use this as a tool. Uh, for instance, Airfare Watchdog, uh, Princess Cruises. I'm not going to go on a cruise again for a while, but I don't mind getting an email. So I have it bypass my inbox and go to junk. So if all of a sudden I decide that I want to go on a cruise, I go into my junk folder and look for the most recent ad from them. And then I can set my junk folder to automatically delete things after 30 days. Because most things, you know, anything that's in your junk folder, if it's if you so you can use it as a tool for things you really want to subscribe to but don't want in your inbox, or if it's really junk, you don't want it to sit there forever, and you can say delete after 30 days. So that's the difference then one of the differences between junk and trash, right? Trash you just don't ever want to look at again. Well, trash is when you want to delete it, and it goes, and then your trash will usually empty after a certain amount of time. But yeah. Uh, Trash is when, yeah. And then the beauty of it is, if you go into settings, let's go to our mail settings. Oh, so here's one thing. Okay. Let's say, okay, for instance, if you go to macnexus.org, actually, I'll show you this. This is a sidebar. Macnexus.org. You'll notice here I have a little thing that says, click <coughs> There's a little thing down here. Imagine there's a <laughs> imagine there's a little thing down here that says click here to sign up for the iTunes discount email. This is an email that you can sign up for. It's free. When iTunes gift cards get 15% off, it's about once every month and a half I send out an email to you. I don't send it out for any other reason. But let's say you're full up and you don't need any more iTunes gift cards. You would delete that email from me. By deleting it, you haven't told it that it's junk. So you want to get it when I get it, because around Christmas time, you're going to buy a bunch of these for gifts. So you'll keep that in your inbox. If it's something like Prince's Cruises that you don't want in your inbox, you'll go look in the junk if you need it. Tell it it's junk, and it goes in the junk folder. But let's say you get this message about this little blue pill or how you can enhance any part of your body that you want, and you know that it's spam. Don't just delete it, because you'll keep getting it from the same person, like what we would get if you had enhanced body parts. Anyway, uh, so you click on it and say it's junk, and then it learns it's junk. The, if you want something, you want to delete a message, but still keep that person active in your inbox, don't hit junk, hit delete. If you take spam and you hit delete before you've told it it's junk, It'll keep getting it. Okay? So junk is a tool. Did you have a question there first? Go ahead. Is there a way to talk about the spam solution? Yeah, there's rules you can make which are pretty specific and I'd have to get with you on that. But 
if it's from the same thing and you hit junk, it's going to go to, you don't care if it's in junk, if your junk is set to, so what I do is I go into mail preferences, preferences, and I go into mailbox behaviors and say junk. And I say erase junk messages after one month, never, whatever. I usually set it for one month. Anything that's in my junk, it's not bad. Anything that's in my junk folder, uh, anything more than a month would be bad. Uh, anyway, uh, it, you can set it to delete it if you want. And remember, though, if it deletes it here, it deletes it on all your devices because you're telling it to take it off the server. Okay? Junk's very useful. And it, the more you teach it, the better it gets. So if you really want something to go in junk, remember, it doesn't have to be spam. You can make it be something, some subscriptions that you subscribe to that you want, but you don't want them in your inbox. What if you suddenly want it from junk back to You can tell it it's not junk and it will unlearn it. So then the subsequent ones will still come to your inbox. But if it's in your junk, you can read it. You can do whatever you want with it, but it may disappear after 30 days. That makes sense? Everybody got that? So Go ahead. There's, their junk on the iOS device doesn't work too well. And the problem is junk filters don't go from one device to the other. They're device specific. Where did you go to To junk? Yeah. I just clicked on the junk folder down here, but you have to have the mail settings set up to have a junk folder. Okay. Uh, oh, data detectors. This is huge. Uh, let's go here. Let's send an email. Uh, Bob Jones, one, two, three, Main Street, Sacramento. Okay, and party of the century. Cheesecake. Trying to go too fast. This is why I use dictation all the time. Century. Uh, May. Oops, June. Twelfth. 10 p.m. Okay, I'm going to send this to myself because I don't get enough email. So I let it autofill. You'll always let it autofill and send. Oh, test. Okay, so I'm sending myself an email. That'll come in in about an hour. So uh, with this, I'm going to show you data detectors in a second here. Um, while we're waiting for that to come in. Oh, sort columns. So when I'm in my inbox like this, at the top of the column, I can say sort by date or I can sort other ways, but I can go ahead and every time I click the arrow, it'll sort ascending or descending. All right, I just sent, I just got, I got an email from Ken. So I'm gonna click on this email and What's really interesting is, as I hover my cursor over this, oh, well, look at what happened. I'm in Sierra, so this is great. It says, one event found in this email, June 12th, blah, blah, blah. Wow, that's pretty cool. It did that automatically, and this also shows up in your iOS device. But I can say, oh, add that event. Now, if you're not in Sierra or El Capitan, if you hover over this event, You'll notice it becomes this. And when I click on that, it fires up. Calendar, boy, the computer's acting slow. And it shows me in my calendar, and it would show you where it is. Oh, that's okay. Oh, and this was called Party of the Century. And look at this. It even filled in the address that was in that email. 
So I'm going to add this to my calendar. Actually, uh, yeah, 10 p.m. Okay. The other thing is, when I look up here, here's this address. You see it has a data detector also. So if I click on this, oh, I didn't put a capital in Sacramento. Hang on. My data detector is kind of undetecting. There it goes. Wow, this thing's being slow. So there it goes, and I say, oh, okay, well, that's where that location is on Maps. I can show it Maps, but, oh, here's all the information. I can create a brand new contact from that or add or update an existing contact. So when somebody sends you an email that's got an address in it, a phone number, anything else, you don't have to type it back in again. Look for a data detector, and these will be on your iOS device. They'll be underlined, okay? So this is very, very helpful, and it prevents typos. So let's go back to, I'm going to, I'm going to take, I don't want to turn mail off because it'll take so long to get it back. I'm just going to hide it. So if I go to my calendar now, and it was what, June 12th, I think? Oh, look at this. June 12th, party of the century. Everybody see that? So if I double click on that, it fires up the event to give me more information about it. And oh, and there's the address. Oh, man. But you know, that email had the special password to get into the party. I didn't put it on the email. Let's pretend it did. Or let's say there was directions on what to bring or, you know, a special knock on the front door. So if I click show in mail, look at that. It automatically fires up the mail that you made that event from. This is why you want to use Apple Mail, one of the main reasons. Photos, another example. And then how do you put it in contact? That was when you hover over the data detector. Okay. When you click there, yeah. it's taking a minute. Then you go create new contact or add to existing, but I can edit it right here if I want. So you hover over the data detector. Uh, another thing you can do when we do a new message, this is really cool. You can go up here. Oh, actually, by the way, this is not usually up there on top. See this A? That's how your menu bar usually is on these. Actually, your BCC is missing also. So this is how it comes from the factory. So if we go over here and we click on this, this is the photo browser. I don't have photos up, but I'll show you one thing before that. If we go to stationary, here's all this built-in stationary. You cannot modify the actual thing here. You can put whatever you want, but I'm going to go to this photos one and we're going to say, okay, let's use this. So it made this neat stationary. I can fill it in. Not everybody will be able to see it, but whatever text you put in it, they'll be able to see. And then whatever photos, I want to fill these with photos. So if I go up here, this is called the photo browser. Now, my photos program is not open. And this will take a minute to populate. So this is going into my photos program. Even though it's not running, it's not running over here. Okay, so while that's running, I'll go up here and you say hide B or show BCC. So I'm going to click BCC and now I have a BCC field. Anybody here doesn't know what BCC and how to use it? All right. It means blind carbon copy. Blind carbon or blind courtesy copy or blind carbon copy. And what that is is if you put 10 people in the two line, everybody's going to see everybody else's email address. You've all gotten emails that have about 35 people in the two line. And that's terrible because I've seen businesses do it, and all of a sudden you have their customer list. That's not really smart. But uh, not that I've ever used those. Um, but uh, it really, uh, it, it's, it's also bad etiquette on the Internet because everybody sees everybody else's email address. And that's how spammers get email addresses. If you put it in CC, that is the same thing. But let's say I want to send an email to my brother and I want his wife to have to see it also. I'd put it to my brother and then put CC for his wife so he doesn't have to, he knows she saw it also. So that's carbon copy or courtesy copy. 
BCC means if I have a list of 25 people and I want to send it out, no one sees anybody else's email address. It looks like I addressed it just to you because they don't see anybody else. And sometimes you'll see undisclosed recipients, but on the Apple Mail, it doesn't do it that way. And you'll, you'll go in and it's nobody else sees everything else. When they hit reply, it replies back to you and that's it. That's a great way to do it. The only time you wouldn't want to do it is, let's say somebody emails out and they're going to do a potluck party. And they want everybody to respond with what they're bringing. You want everybody else to see what you're bringing. And I always respond really quick and say, I got the salad. So, uh, you know, and I get on that as quick as I can. And everybody else knows the salad is already taken care of. Oh, Ken, he did that again. But, you know, they don't want me to cook food, trust me. So uh, uh, it's, it's, that's the one time when you would want to put everybody in the same group on that. If you have a joke list and things like that. All right, so go ahead. Oh, well, it's a little bit changing the subject line. Is it about is mail? There, oh, yeah. Okay. Is there a way to create a, a keystroke where I can get the text, please do not reply to this email? Uh huh. Show that to me. Nope. After class. <laughs> okay. Everybody else want to see that? It's text shortcuts, and it's in, and you can Google it. But it's te called text shortcuts, and you have it in your Mac and on your iOS devices. So, like a lot of times, you can just print your email. Yeah, it's text shortcuts or keyboard shortcuts too. And so, it's keyboard. It's under keyboards, and it's text shortcuts. Let's look at. Uh, oh, search. Okay, remember I talked about how big my email is. So I can go up here into search, and I can search. Let's say Pete. Okay, do I want it Pete or Pete Losey, Pete Hernandez, whoever? If I just hit Pete, it gives me everything that has the word Pete in it. But if I say, let's say Pete Losey, it's from, oh no, I want to search to. So it's the ones I've sent to, to him. Or I can search entire message for the word Pete. Okay? And then over here, it's I'm searching all my boxes. I can say just search my inbox. Just search my sent box, et cetera. So you have very, very, very powerful search in here, and it searches across all your boxes. I want to point out one preference you guys all need to change because it's on default, it's bad. And that is preferences, general, and it doesn't normally search your junk folder. It's off by default. We want it to search your junk folder because if you're expecting an email from someone and you say search, it's only going to search. If for some reason it put it in your junk folder, it wouldn't be searching in your junk folder. And that's a lot of times where the false positive will end up. I did want to point out one other thing. I'm sorry, on the new message, you want to hit this A. So this is your formatting bar for all your fonts in your email. Just because you can't read doesn't mean you should make the outgoing font be 24 point. Uh, it might make it so you can read it, but it'll really make it really big for the other person. On the other hand, don't make it eight font either, but you can adjust it. But don't get super fancy. This is not a word processing document. Your email should be quick, concise, and use generic fonts, generic colors, because not everybody can see it. If you have a special font that's really cool, if they don't have it on their computer, it's not going to show up. And everybody spends all this time spacing their letters out and all this other stuff. No. Twitter is 140 characters or less, right? Text messages should be about that length. And email can be a little longer. I'm sorry. Email is not the old way of sitting down and crafting a letter with cursive handwriting. By the way, keep with cursive handwriting because the kids won't be able to read it. It's like, it'll be like, in, it'll be like invisible ink. But you know, you used to sit down with a letter and you'd, you'd either type it or put it out and you'd spend some time on that. Emails are quick. Don't burden, th don't forget about yourself. Don't burden the recipient with reading this long email that's full of garbage when you could say it, be concise. If you can say it in three sentences, say it. Don't say, don't say it in 12 paragraphs. Because Lord knows we all get a lot of email and it's the old, it's called a, a TLDR. TLDNR, too long, did not read. 
we're all getting shorter attention spans because, oh, shiny squirrel. You know, we've got so many different, different devices pulling at our attention. We've got Facebook here, email, text message, phone, TV, you know, whatever. Somebody had a question here, Judy? You shouldn't send images in the mail. That's the new, that's the new thing. Uh, and I had it in my signatures. You can send an image if you're trying to send that image, but like in a signature, don't do it anymore because it's, it's not seen by 95% of the people. But you're talking about an image you want in an email? You want to just put an image in an email like one of your trip photos? Probably the same for everybody else. So it's it's hey, Judy's got the secret image. Nobody knows what it is. And if we could type in cursive, we'd be all set, right? Uh, it I it could be a different type of an image that could be causing the problem. Yeah, and when you put an image in here too, when you if it's a, if it's from photos, it will ask you what size you want to send. You can never send more than 10 megabytes in an email, okay? Because that's very bad. You'll, some people can read it, some people can't, but you don't know whether they got it or not. So you don't send a ton of photos. You let photos handle that, and that would be covered in the photos class. But yeah, it, it just could be a little different image. Uh, there was another one over here, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna ask, I have a couple of friends that um, are having issues with the culture of sentence. So they told me well, they have a thing on their computer that you know bumps up the size, uh -huh. of the, but but I could be doing this for them when I send them the email, no, right? No, no, no. Just because then the yours, computer. they're reading the web on this, and they've got it so they can see the three words on their screen. Those are called JAWS machines, oh, okay? okay? Which, by the way, if people are sight impaired, they can get this and plug it into. I could have this displayed up here. Can't get much bigger than that. You don't need those six thousand dollar JAWS machines. But the problem is, if I get it zoomed into the size I want normally, and you send it in huge oh, okay. text, yeah, then it's overdoing it. Okay. You're, you're trying to do them a favor, and that's okay, but if they've got the capability on that end, just send it out. Be you, Think of email as the lowest common denominator. Okay? Let it check. See, this is probably fake. Because my credit's frozen. Oh, that's USA. They give me my credit report all the time. So, No recent... Credit activity found. Well, that's a good thing. Nobody's. I have my credit frozen, by the way, so I never have to worry about that stuff. Yeah. Yes. I got an email supposedly from USA and they wanted me to verify all my good information. And the only way I could tell that it was they, they, they did put the last four of my numbers, number, they just put zero, zero, zero in there. Yeah. yeah. So you can always hover over the address and see what that is. So in this one, let's let's take a look. Let's make this one be our case case in point here. So if I go up here, I'm going to hover over that, and it's going to tell me who it's from. Actually, I'll click on this side. Experian Direct. It could be because I think they use the Experian, and then the reply to. Let's see who it's replied to. Ah, oh no, that's still Experian Direct. So. That's probably okay, but I would be a little suspicious. Experian, of course, is one of the three credit agencies, but uh, I would then go directly to U.S. Whenever I get an email that says, like, you know, get a little thing like that, I just go log right into the account, and it'll tell me. It'll give me alerts there. So this one is true. Uh, Google does a really good job of trying to filter this stuff out and seeing if it's spam and phishing and stuff, too, and Apple does somewhat, so... Um, but you've, you, you know, it all comes down to you guys in the end. So you've got to be very, very careful. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Good question. So. The email is saying they've been scammed, and they said, don't open what I sent you when I was scammed, or is this saying I'm... It says a friend of mine said he was intensely scammed. Okay. So, I, I hope so they're trying to send you the scam. They go, I got caught, so it's time for you yeah. to get caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That's the kind of friend we all want to have. <laughs> that, those, those people go into our junk folder. <laughs> um, so, so here's the deal. You're on a Mac. You're on an iOS device. You 99.8% of the time can't get hurt. You, if you don't keep your system updated, is that little 0.02%. If you keep your system updated, Apple's very good about making sure that vulnerabilities and any future vulnerabilities are plugged. That's why these phishing attempts, PH phishing attempts, are so successful, where they send you something that looks like it's from USA and things like that, that it's not. Those have nothing to do with your computer. They have to do with the psychology of the con man. And your computer, so I've gotten emails before that I knew had viruses in them. I click them and see what happens. Nothing happens. Not worry about it. You might occasionally get a malware pop up. The problem is, and everybody used to say, well, apples don't get infected because they're such a small part of the market. The guy doesn't, they don't write the things against it. That's a load of hooey. Because virus writers and scammers, if they're not trying to get something from you uh, monetarily, they're like these guys just doing graffiti. The guy that gets his graffiti on the best overpass, he's the king of the graffiti guys, right? So the guy that would write a successful replicating virus for the Mac, he would be the king. So it's not that they don't try, it's they can't, because it's a very safe, secure platform because it's designed from that way. In fact, it's even gonna be more safe this fall when we go with a new file structure system. But uh, it doesn't mean that it's, that it's completely invulnerable. Uh, it can have some things. So you want to stay on top of your updates, still be suspicious. There's not been any, there's been theoretical instances of them happening, but it's not. As far as email accounts though, email accounts sometimes get hijacked. I know a lot of people that have had their email address used by someone else and they get these email back, they go, God, or you get all these bounced emails that look to come from your account. Someone just had your email address and they're using it. And that's one of the main reasons to get off Yahoo because 98% of the time this happens to, it happens to a Yahoo account. And it's sad. And so don't really get in. But if you're ever suspicious of anything like that, remember, email, your email account is the key to the kingdom. Because if you have to go to Amazon or your bank or Pizza Hut and reset your password for those places, they're gonna do what? Send it to your email account. And then you're gonna click on that because it's got password reset to go back. And if you request the email, it's fine to open it. But the problem is, is that if somebody else gets a hold of your email, they could go in and try change your account at different places. So it's a constantly morphing thing and they're getting smarter and smarter and they're trying to do it. But be cognizant of it don't be worried about it. It's called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's the same thing they play on when you get that pop-up in Safari that says, you've got to call this. You're, you're screwing up the internet for everybody in the world. We've got to fix this because you've got something going on. Call Apple support at this number. And all those people are trying to do is harvest your credit card. They'll get into your computer. You'll let them screen, share, screen, share your screen. And they'll go in and they'll bring up this thing called a console log or a crash log and see, oh, yeah, this is all bad. See all this here. That's the stuff that goes on all the time, but they're playing on your FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So as a PC person, you always should be worried, and it's easier for them to play on that. As a Mac person, you should only be judicious about it. You shouldn't need to be worried. And don't be worried because that's what causes these overreactions to when those things come up. So uh, don't, don't respond to those, but you know, the other thing is, you get, I don't know, Harry's probably gotten the one. I got this very early on. In fact, it was, uh, remember Fred DeGroot? Uh, remember Fred? He, this guy, he's from France. He used to work for HP in Indonesia. And he's a, no, I'm not from France. He's from the uh, Netherlands. And pretty savvy traveler. And I got this email saying, hey, this is Fred. Uh, I'm stuck in England. Yeah. And... <laughs> And they've got my passport. They're holding a gun to my head. But, and you're the first one I reached out to. I haven't talked to you in five years. But anyway, and this was before this was common. And I had to look at it. The only giveaway for me was 
Fred being very international, I mean, he, he's a smart guy. It was the dollar sign was at the end of the amount. And I got thinking about that. I'm going, well, that's the way they do it in Europe. But Fred's smarter than that. He's been in the U.S. enough, so it made me question it. But those are fairly common. I mean, and, and they go everything. I had a friend. Their son passed away in a car accident. And they're in the process of arranging the funeral and everything else. And they had family coming from El Paso, Texas. And they knew that. Well, an acquaintance of one of the guys of the family that was coming, they were, they were driving from Texas. And calls up and says, hey, this is so-and-so, your cousin. And we're stuck. We had a small fender bender. we got to pay the people $2,000 or they're going to put us in jail and do all this. And he, Western Union... This is when these parents are in the middle of burying their son, their 21-year-old son. And it was just so, so sad. And uh, actually, to Western Union's credit, they are now, because there's a lot of the elderly scams going that way, they have invo invoked some things where they're actually doing some questioning, trying to intercept that person saying, yeah, I need a money order for $3,000 for $3, and blah, blah, blah. And it really... Uh, it's it's amazing that they're tracking down on that. Uh, and now the scams, because now the scammers know that, so now they're doing these things, yeah, you need to, you know, you owe the IRS, or please go get us 300 iTunes gift cards. Yeah. When's the last time? I, I try to pay my taxes with iTunes gift cards, because I get them at a 15% discount, right? <laughs> I can't do it. It doesn't work. So uh, I'll see you in jail. But uh, no, it's, it's just, you know, be, be just careful, but don't be too reactive on it. And here's the future, and it'll be in the next few years. We will no longer have to use passwords. Yeah. We'll use our voice. Yeah. We currently unlock our phones and everything, and, and you can unlock some of your Macs now with your fingerprint. Your fingerprint's unique, but your voice print, not your voice, but your voice print is as unique as your thumbprint. And some of the banks do this, USAA, uh, some of the financial places on the phone, and you would have a passphrase. I'm going to use open sesame. <laughs> and the reason it's a phrase is because, they, because it's the same phrase, so the print dynamic is the same. They don't have to say, okay, this year I said A plus 5. This year it was 672 or something. So... If I say open sesame, it knows that voice pattern. If you have a cold or you're congested, it does not change your voice pattern. It changes the tone of your voice, but not your voice print. And think about how nice that will be. Go up to the ATM. Actually, the ATM now. You, uh, uh, Bank of America, just you come up with your phone. Your phone is trusted. You use your fingerprint on here, and you're no longer having to use your PIN code. So how much safer is that? So passwords are going to go away, but until they do... We're saddled with them. Would you be the same for uh, international trade? You wouldn't have to pass it? Or not? Depends on where I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably could. And, well, yeah. So if you don't use the same passphrase for every account, then you're going to write them down. Or you're going to say, Siri, what's my password for this? <laughs> Open the damn door. <laughs> but, but, because, you're, because your voice print is unique, you would use the same phrase. Do you use the same thumbprint everywhere? Because it's unique. That's why it's, it's, it's going to be. Now, believe me, there's going to be people that decide to use a different phrase everywhere because they want to think it's secure. But good luck with that, you know. What's that? Vanguard tells you what to say, and that's pretty good, too, yeah. So, but they tell you what to say, but do you have to say it? Uh, it's like those, you know, we fill out those little things. Uh, what was your, what street did you grow up on? And you make up one instead of what it is. I wonder if you, I wonder if you have to repeat what it says. That'd be interesting. Uh, if I'm using a Gmail account to read my Apple mail, each of those has a, No, so you want it, that's why if you use Apple Mail, it'll know when you've sent to or gone from. It's the one you want to maintain because it goes across your devices. You can make it sync with your Gmail and with Yahoo and with other accounts just when you set it up. 
But the thing is, is it's best to keep it in the iCloud because it's available one place, it's available everywhere then, and it syncs fine. If you have, if you have uh, uh, duplicates, it will handle that for you too. I have occasion where I have to use a PC at a place where I'm So then you want to have your, uh, app, your contacts in the Mac sync with your Google contacts, and it will be a completely uh, a complete syncing environment. We'll, we'll do both, and that's not a problem. Judy? It's fine. I didn't say get rid of it. You'll still have it. Well, you're you're only somewhat better off than you are now. We can't cure that because you still have that legacy there. So the thing is, is you'll still check it, but then the next time they publish that, you want them to do your new one and corrected one. And that's again why long ago I did can at kenspencer.com or have something like that that's very permanent before Gmail. But Gmail has made it really easy. Or you can use Apple Mail, but we know Gmail's not going away. We know Apple's got not going away. So, and here we are, Yahoo. You know, Sure West years ago got bought by CCI. Um, so you, they could have made you had to change to myCCI.net. They didn't. They kept let people keep with their Sure West, which is good. Other providers haven't been that nice, and it's at the peril of the user. What's your opinion of using two-factor authentication? I have an opinion. <laughs> what is your opinion? How many have gotten the Apple two-factor authentication thing and you've got all the devices? Okay. So here's convenience and here's security. I'm going to tell you about both. You decide where you want to be. And here's the deal. If all your devices are up to date, if you're on newer iOS 10, if you're on Sierra or El Capitan, and all your devices qualify with that, and you have more than one Apple device, if you have an iPhone and you have it with you all the time, go ahead and leave it on. Because it makes it so nobody can get into your Apple account. Same with Google, down to those. Two-factor authentication means if you're logging in from a computer, we want to verify you're at your phone. And so you get a code here, you take that code and type it in here. Very convenient. But if you're running anything older than El Capitan, and you're on older OSs, or if you only have one Apple device, you can't authenticate it from the second factor, so it creates a problem. There's tricks around that that I've had to learn that I made up that I didn't see published anywhere. Um, like people, I have people still running Snow, uh, Snow Leopard. Um, and that won't do two-factor. You put in your Apple ID password and put in the code right after it and it takes it. But it doesn't even pop up on the screen. So two-factor is a pain in the butt, but it secures your account. And when you think about what's all there, Apple is putting it on by default because the problem is if an Apple account were to get compromised, let's say they wouldn't let you do it. But let's say you had a really easy password like the word password on your Apple account. And someone got into your Apple account, someone would you would say, Oh, my account's been compromised. And then Apple and then it looks like Apple is unsafe. When in fact, it wasn't the per it wasn't Apple that was unsafe, it was the person's password that was unsafe. With two factor, it requires that. If they someone could have your password and they can't get into your account if they don't have the thing to do the second factor, the second thing to authenticate. So I leave it on in mine because my phone is always with me. And if my phone isn't there, my iPad's there. I mean, I, I, trust me, I always have at least one Apple, or at least two Apple devices with me. And it goes out and checks all your, you'll pop up on all of them. So two-factor is a pain in the butt, but it's very secure. I always go to convenience on everything, and I have a lot of clients that I counsel them on that, and I say, let's turn off two-factor. You can do it. You have to be able to authorize the two-factor to turn it off, which is a bit of a catch-22, but it can be done. Uh, but 
it, it all depends on what you have linked to it. I have a lot of, I have 400 bucks worth of credit on iTunes and different things like that. And I just, it's very sacred to me. So I make sure I keep it on because it's not that much of a pain in the butt. But if it becomes, if the pain factor is higher than the security factor, it can be turned off. And I can show you, I mean, we can, everybody's a little different. We can do that. Um, I, that'll get cured when we have voice because you don't, if you're not signing in with a password, you can do it. And again, our thumbprint works really well for two-factor also. And, and actually, the other nice thing is now what Apple's done recently is they've allowed us to have app-specific passwords. So I forget how it works, but I just had it on one app, and I can't remember what it is. But that's a new thing coming up where you can create a new password for the app it still allows app. It took. It still allow. It allows. Oh, here's what it is. It allows the app to have access to your iCloud stuff, but it creates a new password for that, so it doesn't have your real Apple password. It's a, it's app specific passwords. This is going to be coming up more and more coming soon, and you have to have two factor on for that. It, it's only complex because they're trying to keep people from doing bad things, because they'll get blamed. That's why I have believed from day one why the Apple never had a replaceable battery in it. Because think about this, the person has an iPhone and their battery gets a little old or they get lost or they want to turn up. They go and buy a cheap, cheap battery and put it on the back of their iPhone and it blows up in, in their pocket. What's the news going to say? Some cheap, some cheap Chinese battery blew up in this person's pocket or is it going to say iPhone blew up in somebody's pocket? So. They have to protect the brand in that way, and I think that's why they do two-factor by default. Mm -hmm. It's best for you, but at this point, it's a little bit inconvenient, but it is best. And I, sorry, I mean, not just, everybody's been dealing with that, and it's glad you, I'm glad you brought it up. When is it turned off? Does it have to be on? So it's, it's always on, and when you, when you log in, if you go to the website, and you're logging into your iCloud account, but once your mail's checking and everything else, it's if you go in and manage your account or go do anything in your account. If you're uh, signing up a new device on your, on to iTunes onto your account, it will create two factor. Believe me, you know it because you've had it. And it pops up and says, "What do you you know?" First, the screen comes up, and that's what's weird is it says, um, and it shows a map on here, and it says somebody's signing in from this place. You know, look at that and going. And I had so really, what's really funny is I had a client who they lived in let's say Roseville. But the sign-in was showing by Auburn. And they're going, I'm not in Auburn. Well, that's where their internet, their home Wi-Fi internet's providers on-ramp to the internet was, so they thought it was Auburn. But you just see the map, and then you say allow, and then you get the six numbers. Don't write them down. They're one-time use numbers. You just put them in, and they go away. So, uh, if you have issues with that, you know, send me an email. And as I say, everybody is. Uh, Send me an email. If I don't respond within 24 hours, assume I'm dead or in jail. And if not, it's okay to email me again. It's not bugging me because when you get over 200 emails a day, some of them scroll off the bottom. And, and so it's not nagging me. It's okay. Say, this is the second time. And if I don't hear from you by the third time, then you can guilt me into it. Okay? But it's not. Don't worry about it. It's just I try to respond to them when I can. Oh, and keep it short. <laughs> and Google it first. <laughs> I, I get the ones now. People, hey, I tried Googling this. In fact, here's my results. Uh, can I get the key to get in and have you ask me the question now? So it's kind of funny. So, uh, any other questions on mail before we we're over a little over? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, go ahead. When you were talking about junk, is there a security scam that you see in the junk? Is there a way to? So once it's in junk, you can then delete it. My thought was, don't delete it first, because then junk won't learn it. But once it learns it junk, it will always put it into junk. But you'd have to go to your actual email provider and say it's spam there. More than likely, junk's going to filter it with what you need. 